First Smoke family, listen up. Russ Brandon, plant agronomist, cannabis microbiologist, 20 plus years in the business, plant scientist. You gotta listen. This is PhD level plant science. No matter if you're a hydroponic grower, cocoa, soil, aeroponics, we talk about plant tissue samples, sap samples, biological steering, plant steering, crop steering. We get deep in the weeds, pun intended. Also, Dr. Dabber. If you want codes to Dr. Dabber, GrowGen, Drip Hydro, all the affiliates you see us rock with, fsotd.com slash sponsors, or just go to fsotd.com, go down to the sponsors, click the link, and it gets you hooked up with all the codes for our sponsors. It gets you linked up with discount codes, gets you priority, and also gets you access directly to our sponsors, Dr. Dabber, GrowGen, and Drip Hydro. Shout out tier three gang. At the end of every episode, you get to see the people who support us and show love. It helps us keep going. This is how we keep filming three, four hour episodes with people. We do all the off the mics, all available at fsotd.com. If you like our guests and you wanna hear more from them, all you gotta do is go to fsotd.com, super simple, and you get so much more material behind the scenes, unedited, unfiltered, fsotd.com. Yo, wait till you hear this episode. I'm blown away. I was introduced to cannabis probably in around uh, eighth grade or so. It was just a kind of a spiritual and mental awakening when I started using it. You can set up all your parameters and your SOPs based off of the data that's been collected. Oklahoma still? Yep, Oklahoma. It's gonna be an ADA, territory cannabis. So we have, uh, you know, I think it's about 12,000 square foot facility. It's gonna be all organic soil. Mr. Brandon Russ. First Smoke family, we have a great episode today. I'm super excited about this. This is for anyone into plants, biology, soil, soilless mediums, hydroponics. This has been one of the biggest people I've been paying attention to in the space over the last year. This is someone that no matter what type of plants you're into growing, doesn't matter if it's cannabis, doesn't matter if it's dragon fruit, all these cool plants that people are getting into. I do cactus on the side as well. This is someone you need to pay attention to. This is Brandon Rust, AKA Rust Brandon. Welcome to First Smoke, bro. Man, I'm privileged to be here. Thank you for inviting me out. Um, I'm really excited to do this episode. We're gonna take a <laughs> deep dive into the science and practical application of organics. We're gonna talk about synthetic created fertilizers. We can get a little bit into hydroponics as well. We can kind of go all over the place and really give a comprehensive understanding to your listeners on how these things function from not just a chemical standpoint, but from a biological standpoint as well. So let's start it off with a hot topic. Synthetics versus organics or synthetic organics. What's your take on it? You're the organics guy. I see a lot of gardens raising their price and saying living soil we're growing with soil now so now it's a 400 dollars ounce instead of a 300 dollars ounce or now it's a more expensive right it's it's a higher standard is how they're putting it what's your thoughts on organics versus synthetics so it is a hot topic and it's one that's been debated to no end and so hopefully we can you know show the pros and cons of both um when it really comes down to it I personally think that you have to understand that organic, in my line of thinking, it means carbon. Carbon and organic are synonymous. They are one and the same. When we're talking about carbon-based life, that's what we're talking about is organic matter. Anything that is organic contains carbon and oxygen in it. And it's two elements that are always going to be together. Um, that being said, 
you know, there are, there are some things to, to, to consider. And one of them is what a salt is, right? So let's talk about, let's start there. And when you say salt, you mean a synthetic, basically nutrient. No, you just mean salt in general, salt in general, because I think there's a misconception Mm -hmm. of what salt is. And so there are salts that are natural and then there are synthetic, synthetically created salts. And the base of what a salt is in chemistry, it is when you have a positively, um, a positively charged cation, a molecule let's say like magnesium and then you have a negatively charged anion let's say sulfate when you have a negative and uh, uh, positively charged molecule they'll bond together so in this instance that would be magnesium sulfate also known as epsom salt now epsom salt is natural it can be you know pulled out of the ground and mined and it is not organic, but it is natural. So there is a difference because a lot of these salts like magnesium sulfate or gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, they're used in organic production. And it's because that the usage of these are not going to acidify soil. It's not going to have a negative impact on the soil itself. And it's because of the the anions, the negatively po- uh, charged anions and the positively charged I- ions in those salts aren't as highly reactive as a synthetically created salt like diammonium or monoammonium phosphate. Um, so there are different types of salts. There are naturally occurring salts, usually mined, which also have environmental impact. They're, you know, they are dependent on resources energy resources to get them out of the ground so um it's one thing to take into consideration i think that also when we're talking about organic there's organic that which is like the science side of organic versus the practice because a lot of people are who say organic they might actually mean natural that's what i was just about to say something can be natural but synthetic well it can be it can be natural, but not organic. Got you. Right. Okay. So if it's synthetically created, then it is, is not natural. But a lot of these things are, you know, they're used in the same types of ways regardless. So can the plant tell the difference? No. Interesting. Because that's been the big debate. We're talking about salts, mm-hmm. natural salts and organics, magnesium sulfate, iron sulfate, gypsum, um, those types of things, those are available. They're soluble in water, which means you're going to deliver the actual ions that the plant needs when they need them. So for the, ma- the majority of these naturally, natural salts are available and you can get the same result that you would from a synthetically created um, chemical. The only difference is in organics, there are typically your nitrogen source is going to be carbon based and it's because of the way that nitrogen actually works so nitrogen is one of those things that is highly biologically dependent now a percentage about 10 percent of our nitrogen comes from lightning in the atmosphere it's interesting so what happens is 78 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen but it's in this triple bond n2 it's a gas it takes an ex- a lot of energy to be able to separate those bonds. And then once it's separated, it bonds, it'll, um, it'll uh, bond with hydrogen to create ammonium. And so you can get ammonia, ammonium in your soil through lightning. Um, there's also the biological process of nitrification where you have bacteria that are able to use atmospheric nitrogen, these bacteria, they create a metabolite, a secondary metabolite called, or it might not even be a secondary metabolite. It might be a main function of their metabolism for some of these organisms um, called nitrogenase. And nitrogenase is an enzyme. When we're talking about enzymes, what we're talking about is a protein. And what this protein does is it actually 
allows for the separation of those nitrogen bonds to create ammonia, ammonium. And so it goes from an un the nitrogen goes from an unusable form for the plant and then it's created, you know, and then ammonium is created a form that can, the plant can use. That process also works in reverse to where nitrogen can be turned back into gas and then released from that system. Um, the, the, microorganisms, the microorganisms that are responsible for that process to be able to bring atmospheric nitrogen, convert it into a plant available form usually happens in anaerobic conditions in low oxygen conditions because that nitrogenase protein is highly susceptible to oxidation because it's formed from an iron and molybdenum uh, protein complex and those those elements are highly oxidative and so typically what will happen is that these bacteria will live in the root in nodules inside the plants and like legumes and it's because that nodule will actually protect that that nitrogenase from oxidation so that way that that process can happen now there are free living soil microorganisms like cyanobacteria that can also convert um nitrogen in regular conditions not anaerobic conditions but the amount of nitrogen that they're actually contributing is negligible if we're looking at uh nitrogen um like target for a plant it's not going to produce enough those free living soil organisms to get that nitrogen in there so it's mostly those those um anaerobic organisms that are producing it and that is a problem because typically we want to have a lot of oxygen and drainage in our soilless media and so you can actually also lose nitrogen just by letting the soil dry up because the bacteria will actually consume either there's a couple of ways that nitrogen is actually immobilized it's because there is competition between the the organism and the plant for that nitrogen and that nitrogen will not become available to that plant until after it's cycled where that microbe is maybe eaten by a protozoa and that protozoa then has that waste product which is then available to the plant this is like the food web yeah in the soil web yes okay and so so to dumb it down a little bit basically you're talking about one microbe eating another version of a microbe, correct? Yep. And then it basically shits it out. Yes. <laughs> and then the plant can use that. Yeah. Because it's broken down. It continues to be broken down. Is that a size thing or is that just a broken down mineral thing? Well, typically what happens is when an organism uses nitrogen, it's because it needs to build proteins. And uh, phosphorus is another one that is highly biologically dependent and we'll move on to phosphorus next. So in this, in this uh, organic system, these microbes, right, they're utilizing the available nitrogen sources and then they're building their structures out of them. They're building amino acids, they're building proteins, they're building their DNA. Mm. And they're also, if they're photosynthetic, they might be building chlorophyll centers. Um, so nitrogen is really important now when that organism bra uh, it, it is, is decaying once it's no longer living and functioning those that nitrogen is now complexed in a form of a protein or amino acid so it can be metabolized by plants because interestingly enough you know there's nitrate ammonium and amino acids are the three types of nitrogen that a plant can observe and the amino acid being the only actual carbon-based uh, nutrient and it's interesting too because what has to happen there's a process where the plant prefers nitrate because it's negatively charged and what happens is there we talked about this a little bit where there's sap a, a, a charge associated with the sap so all the fluid that the plant is taking up the majority of the elements are positively charged so calcium magnesium potassium sodium those are your four base soil cations but also iron manganese zinc copper and then um uh ammonium right those are all positively charged and so what happens is if you keep putting positive charge in the sap you need something to balance it out so the plant actually prefers nitrate because that nitrate is actually a negatively charged anion and so if it's pulling up more of that nitrate it'll balance out that sap 
Same thing with silica, that's negatively charged. That helps with that as well. And there's places people only dream of going. I've been there. Too. Um, so you need balance in plants. Yeah. It can't just be all positive or all negative. Well, that's why we have different type, you know, we have positive and negative anions that the plants observe. And the, the, you know, the negatively charged anions are more highly reactive and they also don't attach to the, to the to clay colloid surfaces or organic matters because those are usually also negatively charged for the most part. And so they can be leached out through systems. That's one of the big problems with the synthetics, right? Is like we talked about how that nitrogen is, uh, it's basically attached to carbon groupings now, amino, uh, amino acid grouping. And what has to happen with nitrogen is that the nitrate will be uptaken right but because that's the preferred form but then it has to actually be converted back into ammonium before it can be converted into a amino acid which is then converted into a protein and then those proteins make all of uh they encode the dna's that's what's used for dna production it's used for enzyme production because enzymes are dna they're just different they they the difference between a, just a protein and an enzyme is that enzyme works to do something internally like uh, mecha mechanistically inside of the plant and so that takes energy and any of these processes inside the plant require atp adenosine uh, adenosine triphosphate which is a phosphate grouping uh, attached to sugar molecule and that all it's it's considered the biological exchange currency for all uh, biology all cellular mechanics it requires energy for this process and it can take up to six uh, like i heard it was up to like could be up to 18 percent of the plant's metabolic energy is spent converting nitrate to ammonium ammonium to amino acids and then those into protein so it can build proteins are what build the 3d structures around us from molecules so everything that we see in organics is based off of these 3d protein constructions so the plant is basically building itself into reality out of these these protein structures, but it takes energy to do that. Now, if you were to just feed amino acids, you get to skip all of that those steps. So you're saving metabolic energy within the plant, and your the plant can take up L chain amino acids, and so it does it can take those amino acids and just start building proteins. It doesn't it skips the energy dependent process of converting nitrate to ammonium, ammonium into uh, amino acid with the same quality output yo the, the it, product, better yeah. you're, you're, you're getting yeah. a better output and the reason why is because when you are saving metabolic energy that means the plant can allocate that energy towards other processes whether it's terpene production uh plant beneficial compounds or creating more uh metabolites that are put back into the soil system to promote bacterial and fungal growth so that those uh so that those um, colonies of rhizobacteria can either decrease or increase pH depending on what the plant might need at a specific time, you know, because the plant does a lot of interesting things through its exudations. You know, it can, it's got proton pumps where it can dump hydrogen to decrease soil pH if like uh, to make iron more available, for instance, right? It's so it'll regulate the medium on its own knowing I need more iron. So let me dump this so that I can uptake more iron. Yes, it's that's an amazing thing that a plant can do. I don't think a lot of people and that's why we have a few books in front of us and I don't want to but the art of balancing soil nutrients, something that you highly recommend for most people. Yeah, getting into soil. So this this book right here, I brought this book because I use one exclusive lab because I do, you know, I do agronomic soil recommendations and I I created what is called biological crop steering. So I took all of the applicable sciences. I, I looked all of the, the literature for the science and I created practical applications that can be re replicated and they can be shown on tests, right? So that way, if someone says, hey, I want to know if this works, I can unequivocally prove with data 
that something biologically is going to affect the system as a whole, and we're going to be able to see it on data. Real science backed up with test results instead of bro science backed up with Anecdotal color looks evidence. more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anecdotal evidence. I was going to say looks more colorful and it looks bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Or smells better. Yeah. Which, which you need to know actual terpene output. Yep. What are the things you test for? So when you're testing for these results to see that the microbes are working and that the soil is actually doing what it should, what are you testing for? So first of all, um, I think that a lot of organic growers, they put too much emphasis on their microbial life. And they're always saying, hey, man, it, I just have to feed the microbes. I just got to feed the soil. I just got to feed the soil. So it, you do need to have adequate carbon to proliferate the biology. But for me, I'm actually looking at nutrition of the soil because that and then the balance of that nutrition, because that's going to actually create homeostasis because all of the elements the microbes also utilize right the carbon to nitrogen ratio should be at a certain rate your you know your ph and all that stuff all of those it, when we're looking at a system holistically i start with nutrition the by as long as you have a healthy uh amount of carbon in your soil you're going to proliferate the the right types of microbiology given that your environment isn't askew or that you're not overwatering or creating conditions that aren't ideal would that be similar to someone being like i need probiotics i need probiotics for like your stomach enzymes and your enzymes in your body but not worrying about their actual diet and what they're putting into their body exactly okay. that, that's a great analogy because you can give yourself as much probiotics if, as you want but if you're only consuming sugar then the metabolites that are that are using that sugar are probably creating toxins in your body, yeah. causing inflammation. Right? Why I had to cut out sugar, man. That's and, a big one for you, huh? Yeah. So, our plants plants are a lot like people. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: when we're talking about fertilization, when we're talking about nutrients, we're talking about something that is on such a tiny, tiny scale, right? We're talking about cellular fertilization because what's actually happening is these ions that we're talking about atoms things that are almost beyond our comprehension we have to create these elaborate pieces of technology even to be able to see and understand these things in in reality right and when we're talking about physics and chemistry and biology it's all the same thing it's just the scale at which we're able to go down right because the chemistry mediates biology and biology can help mediate chemistry but the chemistry is a lot of a, it's a lot smaller scale than the biology you're not going to like you could look at uh, an organism of uh, you know that's under a microscope but you're not going to be able to see the elements that they're feeding on you're not going to be able to see the nitrate you know what i mean so it's just a different scale and so we have to take a holistic approach to all this wow that's such an interesting breakdown that biology and and chemistry chemistry is the broken down subject of biology it basically is a, a micro chasm of what happening in biology and then physics is under chemistry interesting it's all mediated by the, the laws of thermodynamics so then to bring it all back to our original question yeah why would i go with soil and organics over synthetics and hydroponics yep so now we're going to talk about the benefits of hydroponics right so one they can be more clean right they're they're usually a lot more sterile they're you know people aren't people who are doing organics aren't so worried about like you know the the, the intense type of like cleaning and deep down like because we understand that you can use biology to combat bad biology Right. So it is cleaner from that, from one perspective. And it's easier. It's much, much easier. You can follow pretty simple recipes and, and, you know, get a result. You can also scale. You can scale organics too. You can scale what I do. But you're saying the outputs there. You can definitely you, have the same output. You, yes. In organics, uh, you can really push things with salts. To like really, really max things out. That's been one of the biggest issues in our, our but, industry right now. But what's, but what's, 
what's the the payoff really is what we have to look at, right? So you can max out yields doing that easy, but we're also we need to take a look at energy efficiency, nutrient use efficiency. We need to look at the efficiencies of these systems collectively, right? Um, when we're looking at, let's say, nutrient use efficiency is a really good one. Let's just theoretically say that we have um, NPK ratio of 10, 10, 10. This is a, maybe a synthetically created fertilizer. Mm. You know, you got your NPK. 10%. And when you say NPK, nitrogen, nitrogen phosphorus, and potassium. potassium. Yeah. And we're looking at, when you're looking at a label, when it has that, you know, 10, 10, 10, or 2, 3, 5, you were looking at that percentage of that element that is in that product. Now, a lot of growers look at the nutrients and they don't even know what those numbers mean. And that's, and, and here's the thing with, with that type of system, when, you're adding something like a 10, 10, 10, just, um, mm -hmm. this is just theoretical. Only 10% of the 10% that's in there, let's say 10% of that nitrogen, right? Is going to stay in a biologically uh, or a metabolically available form, right? And it's because it's so highly reactive. When you put a salt into solution, those ions disassociate from each other. And then when those go into, um, a soil system or a hydroponic system, they'll react with each other, right? That's why you see the precipitation. And this is especially true of calcium and magnesium and always why your calcium and magnesium supplements are always separated because you can't actually mix something like cal calcium nitrate and like a uh, um, diammonium phosphate. Those two can't actually be mixed together in a base because when you put in uh, diammonium phosphate, and that's diammonium or mono, monoammonium phosphate is always going to be the base of your salt based fertilizers, whether it's like Athena or whether it's Jax or Peters or Ambrosia. It doesn't matter what mm -hmm. it is, even liquid products, right? I don't re re ever recommend liquid. Um, if you're doing hydroponics, always use salts. Uh, Raw salts, unliquid. Yeah. Always, really? always. Yeah. You want to do what's the reason behind that cost efficiency? Ah, because yeah. of shipping or because of shipping and the actual efficiency of the product. You're, I mean, if you get, if you were using advanced nutrients, you're paying for mostly water and like, uh, even like some Athena products, I saw a product that, man, what was it? I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was potassium silicate and it was only like 2%. It was zero, zero, two. So 98% of that was just water and potassium silica. That's Agsil. There's only one company company in the U S which is PQ corporation that makes that chemical. You can buy a 50 pound bag of that for like 300 bucks and mix it at zero, and, zero, two, if you want. And, and if you wanted to mix it at zero, zero, <laughs> yeah, two, yeah. you would literally be putting like maybe an eighth of a teaspoon into a gallon of water. So there's practically no actual mineral nu nutrition in those things. So if you know how to utilize the salts and the chemistry behind using those salts, you're going to have far better um, results and you're going to be able to balance things out. But back to that calcium and magnesium thing. The reason why is because w if you put calcium nitrate in solution and you're dissociating the calcium ions from uh, the nitrate uh, ions, and then you also have the ammonium and the phosphate ions that are liberated, what will happen is like the the phosphate, the negative ion will bond with calcium and magnesium. And they'll start doing that immediately. So you lose efficiency. So that maybe 10, 10, 10 that was in there. Once you added your CalMag supplement or whatever. It's a one, you, one, one. It, it be, it, <laughs> no, it's even less than that. You only wow. get about 10% of that 10%. And then how much, and then how much of that nutrient is actually diffused across the membrane of the root is only about two to three percent. And so if we go 10 divided by 10 divided by two, we're looking at a nutrient use efficiency of 0.002% observation of the actual elements that was in that solution. So it's very, very inefficient. Most of what the plant, most of what you're putting into your reservoir is actually be going, you're, you're being wasted. It's all being wasted. It has very, very poor nutrient use efficiency because of the way that those ions react together. And it's one of the reasons why people pH such at a low pH, because if you, because those reactions with uh, phosphate and magnesium and calcium, they, ex they, they happen at pH levels above about 6.3. 
So if you're at 6.3 to 7, you're going to lose much more of those availability. It's also the reason why if you look at the base of any of those salts, you always see the EDTA chelated mineral elements like zinc, uh, iron, manganese. It's because they can't put those as like a sulfate, like a natural form with that diammonium phosphate because that phosphate bonds to all those things in a lower pH and then with calcium and magnesium at a higher pH. And so they're, they're chelating those micronutrients and then you're pHing down so that you don't get the reactive nature with the phosphate and the calcium and magnesium. We're right here, our favorite place to go, you know, where the pros go to grow, at Grow Generation. Over 60 stores nationwide, either in-store or online. Use our code. First Smoke 10. Family, get online if you're shopping for grow goods, First Smoke 10, or in-store anywhere in the U.S. Tell them the First Smoke family sent you. We'll see you there. Wow. For people to just take that in for a second, you know, and this is a deep one because I have, while you're speaking, I end up running through a hundred different questions. One of them being, so if it's a 10, 10, 10, and you're getting 10% of that, 10% of 10% of that. And then divide that by 2% because that's how much is actually at like being observed by the root. The rest is like, you could have solution running through your media, but how much of that solution is actually in contact with the root itself and how much and, and how fast can that root diffuse those ions? through the, the root cells so two things one being what about for people who say well i recirculate my nutrients you know what i'm saying they basically dump the nutrients into a res and then feed again does that help at all is that something that would do you is that a positive because like i think as we've gone now we've come across hlvd and all these things refeeding is something that a lot of people stop doing oh yeah you know and i know it's and it's going around. I know. It's wiping great growers' crops out. Guys that I know are good growers are having crazy issues with it. Yeah. And the crazy thing is it's the reason why they call it latent is because it hides and tests. So you might come clean even if you do test your roots, test the roots, uh, the leaves. You could test all parts of the plant and come back negative, And then it happens. It's, it's a scary one for sure. Is that because cannabis is a bioaccumulator? Uh, or is that something different? No, it's more so, of a viral. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not an expert on the the viral side, and I know that it's not just a virus. I believe it's a viroid, and so it operates different. I think the viroid actually might have uh, protection from the environment, which makes it that much more dangerous. But back to that recirculating yeah. question, you know. I ran a recirculating res. You know, I grew in hydroponics for 11 years before I, know. I switched. And we would switch out our reservoir probably about every three days. So you can get what you need. But again, you're always throwing it out because you're not indefinitely until those nutrients are gone and you end up with just, you know, because you're topping off your reservoir, you're re-PHing. And the reason why those pH fluctuations are happening is because certain nutrients are being used. And if you have a like a positively charged molecule and there's more of those, your pH is going to start going up. Or if there's too much hydrogen in the solution, it'll start going down. So there's different variances of how these things happen. If the plant is dumping hydrogen into solution because it's like, oh, like I'm not getting what I need and it's trying to compensate, it'll drop solution pH. But if you're taking up a bunch of, um, you know, nitrate out of solution, and it's being uptake, and then your pH, that nitrate is not going to be in the solution. It's going to increase pH because you still have all of your potassium and calcium and all that stuff. In so there. is that a good way to then, like, let's say I'm measuring the, what's the runoff of my plants. Okay. And I'm getting my pH is just skyrocketing. It's a good way to see what the plant's uptaking and why not. Well, you would still need to be looking at like something like leaf tissue analysis because then you can actually see how much of your nutrient solution is actually being observed by the plant as a percentage. Gotcha. And you can make adjustments it's like that. It's deeper than just that. Yeah. Yes. And, but the problem, the problem is too, with the synthetically created fertilizers, you can do, you can like, you can't create the ideal recipe all the time, right? If you look across the board at what they're using for their base is, um, um, it's, most always diammonium or monoammonium phosphate. Now, I think that's like an 18, 46, zero. You don't need 46% of phosphate. That's too much. Like total um, PPM in solution adequate is four. 
Phosphorus is, is a really interesting element, right? Wow. The reason why, if you look at re research that's done in hydroponics and they're going, oh, optimal levels are around uh, 25 to 30 ppm phosphorus. Like this, a lot of these are coming out of university studies. They're not taking into the account the nutrient use efficiency when they're actually mixing in those chemicals because that's not how much of the plant is actually observing, right? The plant doesn't need to observe that much. They just need a continual supply. If you were to look at the nutrients that are used most abundantly in cannabis, it's calcium is number one, followed by nitrogen. And typically, uh, the nitrogen to calcium ratio is two to one. So two, calcium, one, nitrogen, also magnesium and potassium. Those are the most abundant. Under that, under all those, and it's weird because magnesium and calcium are both considered secondary nutrients, right? But they are needed in larger quantities than phosphorus, which is considered a macronutrient. And the reason is, is because the plant needs a continuous supply of phosphorus for things like um, the synthesis of plant fats, lipids, and then also energy produ production, because we talked about ATP before, the biological exchange currency for all cellular mechanics. It needs a constant supply of energy. And that's what that phosphorus is. It creates energy for the plant. Now, if you cut off its energy supply or if it's low in solution, it'll start pulling from reserves. And usually the way it does that is it'll catabolize itself, which means it'll break down the internal tissues on the lower parts of the plant. And typically one of the ways that it does that is it takes amino acids, it breaks down amino acids, and that actually releases energy. The plant can utilize that ATP for whatever me metabolic processes that, um, that it needs because it's not getting enough of what it needs in solution. This is just like a starving person. Yeah. And your body starting to break down muscle and fat tissue, first muscle and then fat. Exactly. But in this case, it's about energy. It has to break down those compounds just to get the energy. So it's, it, it, it's a great analogy. I mean, that's, that's, well, I'm just trying, I'm trying to happening. dumb it down because you have the plant science. And now I know a lot of people, it's going to go right over their head. Most people. Uh, until they dive into books and they really understand plant science. And I'm not even saying I'm on that side. I just always relate plants to people because it's so relatable to me of like, this is how a person works. Well, then this is what the plant's doing or vice versa. The plant's doing this. Okay. Well, in a person's, this is what we're missing then, you know? Yeah. And it's a lot of these things are related. You have to realize that when we're talking about nutrition from, uh, from a human standpoint, right? our stomach turns our nutrition into those available ions for our cells to consume for energy. Same way with the plant, the fertilizer is delivering ions so the plant can do all of those processes so they can function. It's the same, same kind of concept, you know, cellular fertilization. It's not like I'm feeding myself. Um, yeah, I feed myself food, but it's like there's nutrition that's for cellular uh, metabolism and energy. Why organics over synthetics? So new, uh, the, we talked about nutrient use efficiency. Um, also, when we're talking about the creation of fertilizers, highly, highly energy dependent. And let's take nitrogen. Nitrogen is mostly created uh, for synthetic fertilizers through the hybrid botch process. And what they do is they take gas um, and then they extract the nitrogen from the gas. Now, there are a couple of places in the world where you can get very, very inexpensive gas. I bet you, I bet you want to wonder where that is, right? I wonder where <laughs> all our, our really cheap gas is at right now. Yeah. Well, it's in Russia. And, oh, really? Yeah. So also <sighs> a lot of the, uh, the potash, uh, which is used for f uh, f um, potassium fertilizers, mm -hmm. same place. And so you're, you're saying that basically Russia's in control most of the world's nutrients for plant production, which means food production as well. Food production is huge when it comes to pr the production of nitrogen fertilizers. You have to remember, you know, I, the, it, the organic community hates, hates, hates big ag, right? And, I'm, and I understand it, but I also understand too, and don't get me wrong, I am not on the side of big ag. You're not a Monsanto guy. I uh, no, I have a key a seedless keychain that says fuck Monsanto on it. You know <laughs> what I mean? I've been toting it around for probably 15 years yeah. now. Um here's the deal though. The advances in science and agriculture have decreased starvation. It has 
th- there was way more hardships. It has created industry. Uh, industrial agriculture is also responsible for the industrial revolution. It's responsible for the way society operates right now. Now, the people who would say, fuck that, I want to see it all destroyed. Those are the types of people who don't understand that it would cause economic global collapse, starvation across the whole world. And, and, and to be honest, that's what we're facing right now. We're facing that not because of climate change or anything, but because of the, the finite amount, amount of phosphorus of uh, parent appetite material. You said 60 years max. 60 that's crazy. And for people to to get a hold of this, we talked a little bit about this on off the mic. So if you want a deeper dive on some of this, but 60 years is about what we have left yes. of phosphorus. The reason I believe the reason why we're seeing all of these changes, green energy implementation, it's why the USDA is allocating currently $800 million in grant money to businesses um, for the domestic uh, production of fertilizers and fertilizer alternatives so like organic fertilizers is because they want to become fertilizer independent places like russia which which have cheap gas that can you know produce cheap fertilizers um they're they're still they cost a lot of energy so it's not that russia has cheap labor they have cheap gas yeah they have resources right and those resources can be so if the gas if the price of um Natural gas increases, so does fertilizer prices, because all of these are produced through this Harbor Botch process for conventional agriculture, right? And it's, de- and it's the whole world is dependent on it. And so when you see the, the price of food increase, it's a direct correlation of what's happening politically in political areas of the world. Because if you want to take control of food production, well, then how do you do that? You go after what grows food. Wow. So here's the issue. 60 years. So the way that phosphorus is produced for, con- for synthetics is we have to take phosphorus out of rocks. So it's called parent appetite material. Typically, it's not any higher than 4 to 8% phosphorus. And it's not an available form. So what they have to do is they have to mine this, this material. Then they have to crush it down and micronize it. So it has a massive surface area, usually around 200 mesh. Um, that's enough to take one gram and cover the surface of a square mile in atoms. They do that to increase the surface area and then they attack it with sulfuric acid. And, and what happens is that sulfuric acid will solubilize and liberate all of the phosphate anion from that parent appetite material. And then they can separate all of the junk and they can separate the phosphate. And then they can take that phosphate and they can mix it with ammonium to create a salt. That's the base of all of these fertilizers. It takes a lot of energy. And the, and the issue is this, we're running out of phosphorus. We have 60 years. The biggest reserves are in Morocco right now. I believe there, it might be, I can't remember who it's owned by, uh, the, the reserves. But as we get closer and closer, it's going to become more energy dependent to produce these, it's going to cost more to produce them. We're going to have to find new areas and new places to mine. We might have to mine the seabed floors. We might have to do things that are environmentally damaging to keep this up. And not cost effective. It's not so cost prices effective. Are so prices going are going up. to increase. Food, prices, thing. everything. If, if solutions are not figured out, we are going to have a global crisis. We're talking about mass starvation and famine. And even if you're in a third world, uh, even if you're in a first world country, it doesn't matter. Every single human being on this planet will be negatively impacted. We have to be able to, to create methods to take what we have available and then make them more efficient. That is the biggest goal is the use efficiency of these things so that we're not wasting it and it's running off into our streams and our rivers and and things like that. That's the biggest problem. Now, you can, you can grow great cannabis. I did it synthetically, but there, there are drawbacks when it comes to the energy use, the nutrient use efficiency, the energy efficiency. And I'm not going to bag on anybody that wants to do that because I grow. I mean, I grew it 
I did a great job. We got top dollar. And there's a lot of great uh, hydroponic grows out there. Like my, my boy Jay at Fresh Harvest in Oklahoma. He's probably one of the best, uh, best um, hydroponic growers. Yeah, shout out, out Jay. Used to be from Cali. Yeah. <clears throat> now he's out in Oklahoma. Fresh Harvest PH. Fresh yep. Harvest. Yeah. Yeah, dude. He's actually a homie. We almost got into a project together out here. But there was a... Yo, what up? It's Blackleaf. I'm here at Grow Generation. And guess what? Drip Hydro storm in the market. All the best growers I know are switching to it. And guess what? There's a reason. Because it's preserving terps. I keep hearing that. Preserving terps. And that's why we're here with Sunshine. Facility advisor, facility manager, overall the man with Drip Hydro. Listen to why it's different, man. What's going on, guys? Sonny here with Drip Hydro. Thing is, at the end of the day, we just wanted to make a simple, clean, cost-effective nutrient line that nobody has really seen on the market right now. Nobody uses really our chelation formulas, uh, the micronutrients that we have pulled to make this line is really just what makes it overall bringing that consistency and quality back to what we want to see in growing herb again and overall at the end of the day it's still really light on your wallet it's a five-part nutrient line and again if you're not staying sterile or you have a big facility and you don't want to run rock wool and you want to run a mix of cocoa with an enzyme or something you don't even have to run flow with it so at the end of the day it's just saving you money on your wallet while bringing the consistency and the quality of terps back we wanted to bring the terps back and bring the soul back to growing versatility cost effective and quality i mean what else can you ask for drip hydro first smoke of the day blackleaf approved peace i was gonna be a sketchy dude involved that was trying to fuck everybody over and because of that everyone kind of just went their own ways yeah but that's how i met jay yeah. was we almost got into a deal yeah. with a sketchball snake and then the sketchball snake went away and i'm like well nice to meet you jay yeah, you know they, what I'm saying? Along do, with everybody else. And they do great, they do great work, man. Solid work. Yeah. They're, they get, they get, you know, hot market prices. They get, you know, fresh flavors, as he likes to call it. Yeah, know. he's close with the homie LA Family Farms. Yeah. And that's, J Joe is one of my, like, closest homies that I look up to in growing. Yeah. And, you know, I met, I met him through my boy Hopper. Hopper was the manager for the Cottonmouth Kings for the first, like, 10 years. And so him and my boy, who was one of the P91 growers, they opened up, I think, the first dispensary in uh, San Diego under the Prop 215. So I think it was like 2007, maybe 2006 or something right around that area. Um, and I was slinging all my weed. I'd go take my purple Kush down there and the Afghani bull rider down there. Ooh, bull and rider. I still have that AB cut. <laughs> I that's hold on to crazy. it. That's a that's a uh, interesting story. Same that, with P ninety one. Crazy story behind that one. Yeah, dude. And it's I, I can't. Nobody seen it. You know what happened to it? Is it just it got cloned out? It started to herm. It got weak. It just copy after copy. And we've seen that happen. You know, if you're growing something for fifteen years, it just tends to happen. You I have an 18 I mean? year old cut now I've yeah. had in my possession for 18. So it probably goes back a few years before You got that. a P91? No, I have oh. a strain called presidential Kush. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's an old like Afghani mm -hmm. Kush cut. Yeah. Um, like the, uh, like the Bubba or the master. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot. Like if you took that and cross that with like the white and it has like this just frosted out. Oh yeah. Uh, Clorox bleach, almost uh, coffee rinds with some mothballs. Nice. Yeah, but interesting because like over the years though, yeah, 18 years, it's the reason we hear a lot in Southern California about the OGs. And no one can find a good OG. We're having trouble finding the gassy OGs. What happened to the smell? Guys that have been running the same cut for 15 years are like, she's just not yeah. what she used to be. You know, who, you know who's got the real OG cut? The real OG cut is John Green Bodie. His sour, yeah, his sour best shit ever. That's OG. Okay. That is that is the OG cut. He gave it to me and I grew it out. Oh, I was like, oh shit. Dude, he put a bunch of jars on the table and I was so people kept hitting me being like, is it as good as you're saying it is? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah I, I smoked the shit out of every single yeah. thing that he gave me. I was like, this is fun. We were rolling joints and you could smell the flower through the joint. Yeah. And I'm passing it and I'm like, and everyone's like, yeah, well, you, it's like, no, we roll a lot of joints. It's not a lot of times that the weed smells so strongly that through the paper, after you rolled it up, put it in a, took it out for the night, you pull it out and you're like, it smells like a fresh bag of weed. Yeah. His, his stuff's on point, man. Yeah. We, uh, it's funny because 
last time I saw him, we were out in Vegas. He dosed me. <laughs> I, we, were, we, we went our separate ways doing our thing. He's like, he's like, yo, he's off. You want to do bong rips, man. I left the keys. He told me where he left the keys on his van. He's like, you can just go and fucking smoke bong rips. The, bon uh, the bong's up in the van. <laughs> He's the kind of guy that'll dose you and then uh -huh. give you the keys to his van so you can go smoke weed. So uh, shout out to shout out to John. Yeah, he had. It's funny. He had some. Uh, he had a couple basically uh, bottles on the table, and he's like, "Oh, this is a cactus, uh, basically extract." And I'm like, "Wait, what?" And then, yeah, we start to realize, like, "Oh man, this oh, yeah. is he's in tune with it. He's, yeah, yeah, he's an interesting guy, man. I was excited about that. I'm also excited about this because there's so many misnomers about." soil nutrients hydroponics yeah. and one of the big topics today is micronutrients and a lot of people say and this maybe this is off but that when we go to raw salts we're losing some of the terpene content and some of the things this is just maybe this is just specul speculation yeah. but we're losing some of the things that made cannabis great 10 years ago a lot of people say what happened to sticky weed why don't we have sticky weed anymore i used to get a bag oh, and it would be leaking and is it genetics is it like what's changing so much that guys that are growing strains today are like this isn't what i used to get or grow so i i know what you mean because it's a tough one well here's the thing so <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to balance to do real proper mineral ion balancing in your solution when you're looking at hydroponics and you're most people are looking at their ppm their ec and their temperature when we're looking at a uh, soil solution ph because i do when i'm doing like a agronomic recommendation i'm looking at different pieces of data i'm looking at a, a, what's called a standard soil test and then also a saturated paste test a standard soil test is kind of like hey this is what is in the soil overall this isn't necessarily what's available to the plant it's just the amount that's in there so it would be like looking at a bottle of uh npk salt and saying hey this is what's in this npk salt now how do you figure out how much is falling into solution in hydroponics what we're doing is we're looking at we're, we're using our our tools or ph meter or multi multi pen meter to figure out our e ec our ph our temperature and ppm whatever. Yeah, whatever. yeah yeah and so we're adjusting the ratios now with my saturated paste test i'm able to look at what's metabolically available to the plant so plant specific ions in an available form and we actually are looking at ec we're looking at ppm but then we're actually looking at every single mineral ion individually so i'm looking at nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium sulfur iron zinc boron molybdenum copper i'm looking at every single one and i can adjust the ppm of my solution based off of what i'm putting into my soil so if i get a soil test and i'm like oh i'm a, uh i do a soil test let's say after a run and i get my results back and i'm looking at it and it says hey calcium is a little bit low it's at you know, 150 PPM and I want it at 200 PPM. I know how much of what I need to add into that soil system to bring it up to that 200 PPM. And so depending on what my other levels look like, I'll go to certain elements, gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. I might use calcium silica. I might use bone meal. Um, it depends on your soil system. You might use oyster shell if it's not too high in chloride and sodium and stuff. But we'll address every single mineral, every single element individually. Instead of just applying an NPK pre-mixed fertilizer, we're actually able to make individual adjustments to every single nutrient. So it's more efficient because you're not putting anything in there that you don't need. So it's more cost effective that way. And then also we're all, everything that you, like when you're doing a top dress in organics, you're buying everything in bulk pretty much. And all of these, you know, 50 pound bags cost like maybe 35, the highest one, maybe a hundred dollars. So it's very, very cost effective. You're gonna, it's gonna cost 25 to $35 for every 10 yards of soil after a run to just bring that back up to nutritional sufficiency. Oh, and have very everything interesting. be balanced because that's what we're doing we're looking at the nutritional sufficiency of the element the, the ionic elements in the soil and then we're adjusting those individually and so, so not only what it costs to produce a run but what it costs in energy wise cost to get that soil back up 
and then continue the next run. Yeah, let's let's look at let's look at a holistic view and we're going to use a cocoa grower that i work with 4-h farms i love cocoa i'm a huge fan they they were doing cocoa before they were running uh dry salt they weren't having all the greatest results so young guys i understand that they're new to the business and they wanted it passionate guys too um so they they did is they switched out their system and now what they're doing is they're doing soil and they have beds and what they do is they test at the end of the run before what they were doing is they were they go and load up their pots put all their cocoa in it get all their lines set up and they'd run this program and then at the end of that run they'd cut everything down they'd have to take that media they'd have to throw it away clean out all their pots refill that media reset you know sanitize and scrub all down their room full resets and then do a full reset yeah. right when we're looking at the labor cost associated with like beds so what you're doing because we're not we're not trying to sterilize everything we're, we're we're looking for homeostasis and balance and so when you go into a system like that you would go in you would harvest your plants you cut it at the at the base of the the stock harvest everything down you know do your general cleaning up and stuff pull all your plants get them into your dry room and then when you reset you just top dress plant your plants directly into that soil so it eliminates a lot of the labor associated with the cultivation and that's huge especially as you scale so if i were to go to a huge place like the farms that they have in new mexico where you might have 80 um 80 000 square feet of canopy in, in a greenhouse in a single greenhouse right and if you have thousands and thousands of two gallon pots with cocoa the labor associated with doing that is going to be exponentially higher so as you scale your labor also scales and that's you're going to have that regardless but you can still decrease that cost by looking at the system holistically and saying oh well we're not one we're not throwing out media and having to buy new media every single time and if you're going to do soilless media you might as well do a living soil right because you can test that soil you can reamend that soil and never have to throw it out and so there your cost when you're talking about a farm's bottom dollar any time that you can save a penny is is profitability and because that's exponentially gross oh. times time money people it, it becomes big small percentages become very big especially quick. at scale i mean yeah. if it's if you're using let's say 60 yards of cocoa every single run oh shit, that's a lot of money and you're doing five runs a year and let's say two of those runs didn't come out so great or one of those runs didn't come out exactly like you thought yeah so now not only are you not hitting all your harvest numbers but now you're having a drop in profitability and you're still having to and you still have time. to have that labor yeah. associated with so it's more cost effective from a labor standpoint also we're looking at energy efficiency so that's one of the reasons why i do leds I, you know, in 2014, I switched from another controversial topic. Oh, come on now. That's, <laughs> that's not even controversial anymore. I mean, you, if you go with the right company, uh, I that's the key, though, because this is the thought, though, Brandon, is that because I, I, from an outside perspective where I'm a cultivator, I love HPS lights. I yep. love high pressure sodium. But because the fact that back in the day all the bulbs we bought were mostly the same right you there was about two or three different yeah. brands but same spectrum yes right exactly now the leds you're buying all not only place. yes and all you're not only place. buying into the brand you're buying into the brand's spectrum yeah. and and to be completely honest there are so many lighting companies out there and most of them are just some dude in his garage who's white labeling from a factory in china right they don't have real customer service they don't really have a good business model they're not able to take a holistic approach to their business and apply it to the people that need it right and so yes. i see that all the time also when we're talking about leds all led components aren't made equally because you have higher shelf diodes you have like i think a through like d right so all the legitimate companies are taking up all of the premium parts and then all these other companies are just getting bottom shelf um diodes and drivers and stuff like that and so they're not going to get the best efficiency out of those lights um but in 2014 i switched from all uh metal halide hps to ceramic metal halide and then when i got to oklahoma led and i had 
I had problems with Delity. I had to figure it out. And I had to figure out which companies were like, oh, these ones fucking work. Like, this is the right spectrum. This is, you know. So I, I, I've done a bunch of different LED companies. I'm with Fos. Okay. And I saw you on their podcast. Yeah. I really enjoyed that one with you and with Green Bodie. Yeah. Great podcast it's, together. The thing is they have the they have a legitimate business. And some people will hate on them because of their marketing, but come on, everybody who's in cannabis knows nobody is going to get 10 pounds of light, yeah. right? It's it's marketing and it worked because whether you love them or hate them, you know who they are. Yeah, that's how I know about them. Yeah. I've, I'm on my fifth LED company over five years. About every year, I switch out my LEDs for a different brand, all 16 or 20 of them. That's what people are like, well, you're just not doing it right. I'm like, man, I'm on my fifth company. And now I'm realizing five companies in growing the same strain for five years. or You get different results. Yeah. I'm getting different results. Yeah. And so now I'm realizing, okay, I'm not only buying into LEDs, I have to buy into the brand of LEDs, the quality and their spectrum, which is my quality output. Because yeah. sometimes I've run into LEDs where they have a huge output and all this, all these claims, but the quality isn't there. So yeah, my yield went up, but I don't like the way my flowers smell and taste. Yeah. And so that's been a big thing with me switching from HPS or MH, right? Where I know tried and true results. I know what I'm going to get when I put one and one together, I get a two. Yeah. Where with LEDs, it was kind of like, oh, there's a bunch of other factors. It's a new learning process for VPD mm -hmm. and even oh, yeah. nutrient uptake. Yep. And those are the two keys. here, let's throw in another uh, curveball. The company is controlling the spectrum. So not only are you not getting like, oh, well, I'm just buying into this system and these other guys are using it. And I know my tried and true results. You got to believe in the spectrum. And I think yeah. a lot of people underestimate that they buy into an LED based on the company or the branding and not on, is this spectrum for quality or is this for production? Because yeah. that's been a, I, you know, this is something I want to talk about with you is the shift in our, because you've been in the industry 20 plus years. Oh yeah. And I read that. I have as well, right? 2002 was my first cultivation in Florida. Mm -hmm. I've seen a shift where we used to walk through grow, grow, basically grow stores at the time with a hat on real low, oh, you yeah. know, with someone else's car and come yeah. in the, from the back and look Operation like- Operation Green Merchant was a real thing. Bro, we need to talk about that. But I remember literally walking in like this, you know, walking into a grow store, like with my arm to this, so that I'm like, well, I got to do something because I know I'm yeah. like, I'm picture, 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 you know? And- but this is the thing. I used to walk the aisles for an hour and I would look at all the different companies and most of the claims were for quality. This will make your fruit taste better. Fruit. This will make this look better. This It was all based on upping quality. Now, when you go to hydroponic stores or, or grow stores, it's all based on production or cost. Yeah. And it's crazy how that shifted from quality to production and cost. And it's like, even with our lighting, you don't hear many lighting companies saying this will produce better quality flowers. You hear this will produce larger flowers, more output, yeah. uh, I cost think, less. I think that's what most people who are, who get into like the cultivation side, who are like, oh, we need to increase our productivity for profitability. I think that the, the there, again, there has to be balance, right? So you want, Nobody comes into this going, I'm going to fucking grow mids, dude. And I'm going to grow a fucking lot of it. Everybody's like, I'm going to grow the best, even if they're not. Yes. Right. And so it's, it's one of those things where having, again, it's a holistic approach. I like the, I like LEDs because they're energy efficient. It was a huge learning process for me because vapor pressure deficit, and then also increasing photosynthetic nutrients. That was a big one understanding that there was more demand for things like magnesium, iron, calcium, nitrate. So knowing that going into LEDs, you're predicting like, okay, I need to pay attention to these nutrients and the uptake and the, the difference in uptake. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because, so if, if you're on a, a bluer side of the spectrum, it's less efficient. It's higher intensity light. And so the plant actually has to work harder process it well red light is actually uh, more photo efficient interesting okay 
So that spectrum needs to have a good balance. It has to have balance. And that balance is what also not all it's not all factors, but it's one of the factors in quality production of flowers. Definitely. I mean, if you were to look at, you know, a like a, a good, a good controlled uh, mixed light uh, greenhouse, for instance, where you have optimal temperatures, you're able to basically run it like an indoor, but you are able to use the sun for the majority of your production. I mean, some of the best flower I've ever grown came out of our mixed light greenhouses when it was like the right season where it was nice and cool. Either spring and fall harvest were always the best because we had nice kind of cool temperature. It was really mellow, but we're getting that direct sunlight. And so there's, there's definitely something to spectrum. And it's a huge, it's a huge debate. You know, who's got the best light? Who, you know, I think that when you find something that works really well, you can also dial in not just the spectrum, but the whole, the whole process you take it again, taking a look holistically and dialing in your environment for specific varietals is really important because you'll have stuff that requires drier temperatures. You know, you, you, and, and when, when I'm on a console, like I know a lot of places that will want to run like multiple varieties in a single room, but they can be really difficult because timing is a big thing that the way that the morphological structure of that plant develops is a huge thing. And so we're trying to create again, kind of a, a system that, that functions synergistically together. That isn't going to have any types of components that are going to be negative. You don't want to run uh, a variety that's short in stature require, maybe it's like has some Afghan in it or something it requires drier soils it requires less humidity it's more susceptible to mold because it has uh denser calyx calyx ratios versus something that has you know more of a, a stretch has wider nodal spacings um it's there again it's it's all holistic approach and then some of those varietals react differently like you said you've seen how spectrum can change morphological um uh, properties of the plant it can change uh, the epigenetics so we're looking at the way that the plant actually expresses itself which could be a cannabinoid expression it could be a terpene expression it could be a flavonoid expression it could be different thiols or sulfate uh, sul uh, sulfides that are being produced by those plants so it's you know and when i'm looking at you know maximizing the genetic potential of the plant you know one of the things that happens in, in organics that doesn't happen in hydroponics, especially things like uh, if you're doing straight rock, wool, right? Cocoa is a little bit different because you can add microbials, you can kind of add organic teas and stuff and not have really a, like, you're not going to have a negative, it's going to be positive. You're going to get uh, there's will be a positive correlation that happens with with doing that. It's harder to create an imbalance. Would that be something said? Or well, it, it's uh, the cocoa because if you're looking at soilless medias, whether you're using a peat based soil or cocoa based soil, the difference is that there's just no other. There's nothing else typically in that cocoa. Maybe some perlite for aeration, and then you're just adding the nutrients that it needs. But you can still add teas, and it'll still hold by hold and house biology. The rock wool. Not so much. It's more of a sterile. It's more sterile than cocoa would be, right? Because you can proliferate organisms in that in that cocoa system because it's that cocoa is an organic substrate, right? Versus the um, uh, rock wool, which is an inorganic substrate. Now, when we're talking about unlocking the genetic potentials of the plants, I talked a little bit about amino acids, right? And what happens is if you're and, and nitrogen metabolism. I talked a little bit about that as well. To get all of the metabolites to increase, those are all carbon-based compounds, right? They're like THC, hydrocarbon compound, all the terpenes are hydrocarbons. To increase those productions, if you can increase, I guess it would be the uh, metabolism, the, the metabolic functions of the plant, you can get higher 
you can get higher terpene profiles, you get higher percentages on your testing results. And I believe it's because when we're saving that metabolic energy, like when we're adding meals and stuff like that, we're getting those amino acids, we're getting these peptides, we're getting these organic compounds that are saving metabolic energy. And so you, you have better regulatory metabolic systems that can help increase those profiles. There's also a thing w- which happens with when you have an environment that allows the proliferation of microbial life, all of the secondary metabolites that they're producing, because just like cannabis, these uh, microorganisms are producing these compounds and these compounds are beneficial, can be beneficial to the plant. So some of them will be phytohormones, which are uh, PGP, our plant growth regulating hormones like auxin, cytokinin, indole 3 acetic acid, auxin, psilocyanic acid, and then also, um, so some of those things can actually help with the internal functions or their active signaling molecules that can upregulate some of the genetic responses in the plant itself. If you have all of the things, proper nutrition, your nutrition is balanced, the plant is going to naturally be able to create all of the different types of compounds that it, that it needs for plant defense. It's going to be able to upregulate the genetics. And so what happens is the ribosomes that are in a plant cell that encode the DNA, if they have everything that they need, they'll, they'll make perfect copies of those proteins and they'll code everything beautiful. So it's the difference between um, having a script that is beautifully written by a calligrapher versus a script that was scratched by somebody who's got terrible spelling and terrible um, punctuation. Yes, it's legible, but, but if you have something that's better readable, it'll express itself in a more cohesive manner. And so that's what we're talking about in, in when it comes to the upregulation of certain gen- genomic responses. So if you're deficient in certain types of proteins um, or you don't have the proper starting material to co- for the ribosomes to code, well, then you're going to have a downregulation. So if you downregulate, you're all sloppy, code's harder to read, it doesn't give the maximum expression. If you're up regulating, you get the maximum expression of the potential of that genetic code. So THC, terpenes, production of flower, everything. Everything. And we're also um, talking about internal plant defense mechanisms. Which is huge right now because we're running into more issues with health against plants, with HLVD, with PM, with all these things that growers can run into. Yeah. So having a good immune system built for the plant is huge. When it comes to viruses, what a virus is, it's, a, it's just a protein and essentially that protein gets into a cell and it changes that, rib- that changes the code that that ribosome is writing so it can replicate itself. Because on its own, it's not so much like a living organism because it, it can't reproduce without infection, right? But it is a carbon-based protein. It's a protein, right? And the thing is, microbes use carbon-based everything like there's all these different microbes they could use so it, it's crazy because there's all these different modes of metabolism that bacteria and uh, and fungus can switch from right so it could be uh you know it can be a photosynthetic microorganism where it's y- using atmospheric carbon and the sun is energy or it could be an organism that uses organic matter in the soil through the breakdown of organic matter and it's that's its fuel source And if you're talking about something like a purple non-sulfur bacteria, it can switch through like four different modes of metabolism. It can do fermentation. It can do photosynthesis. It can take, act as an electronic, uh, except they're from like nitrate and sulfate. And uh, and it can also get its energy from the breakdown of organic matter. And so if we're talking about organic matter in the soil, it's carbon-based. That virus is organic. It can be destroyed and used by different organisms in the soil. So that's another benefit. Man, that's huge because something that's uh, one of my good friends who ended up getting murdered over a strain, uh, we call them modern epigenetics was his name, right? But Mike, yes, RIP Mike. Familiar. Oh, you know, okay. You know, yeah, I actually grew out, uh, it was a reversal. Like 
can't remember what it was, but I, I did. I've grown some of their gear before. Yeah. I mean, great guy. One of my favorite people. I couldn't believe like unbelievable story what happened to, but uh, he was the first person who sparked my interest in this because he used to always say, you have all these old cuts that you've been sitting on for 15 years and all this. If you get those in good soil, we can bring those back. We can bring those, the potential of that strain back up to a hundred percent or close instead of having the tissue culture something for a year and a half, because people think, oh, let's send it to tissue culture and we'll get it right back in six no, months or a year. Huge process. It is, it's it, like three stages to get it to a clone. And you might have to do it multiple times. Now we're learning because people are sending these OGs to tissue culture that to get it back to 80, 90, 100% health, you might have to do it three, four, five times to, to re-TC something. And then, so you're talking a year and a half, maybe two, maybe two and a half yeah. to get it back to. And then now I'm hearing growers say, dude, I used to have this OG that would finish in like nine weeks. Now it's going 11, 11 and a half. Yeah. Once you get it back from TC, yeah. something about something's happening. I feel like we don't take enough lessons from big ag and from agriculture in general. And we try to apply a lot of bro science. And then we find out about things late as a, a as cannabis. Yeah. Well, here's, a, here's the issue. Um, so I've actually spoken to a lot of different agronomists and people that work in the university. And the issue is this, because of the federally funded status of a lot of universities, they wouldn't touch cannabis because they would lose funding. And the way that the university systems are work is big corporations. They fund these types of research and stuff. And then they get the actual IP that's developed through the students, you know, research. And stuff so that's like that. where the money comes back and where the money comes. From. Interesting. And so, but they're so far behind on their science. You know, I was looking at, I was watching some, a podcast, some science po podcast from Cornell University, and I was looking at their research white papers, and they're trying to figure out the, you know, like how much phosphorus, how much nitrogen. It's like that they are so far, like they're a decade behind all the stuff that I've already done because I have for the last, because I, I mean, I've been growing for a really long time, but it wasn't until I got into commercial space where I was like, okay, I have to figure out how to scale out this organics, and I need to be able to make sure that I can do this over and over, which means I need data. So I started doing the data-driven uh, agronomy, and then I developed the biological crop steering, which was you know eliciting certain aspects using microbes instead of uh, fertilizers. And it just changed everything because I taught myself the agronomy, and now I apply that to all of my consulting services. So that way you can read, like, it, cannabis is so difficult, right? And if you can make it so that way you don't have to focus or take any types of guessing, you have these SOPs that work really well for your cultivation, you can focus your energy on the other parts of the business, like your branding and your marketing and doing your payrolls and your, and your taxes and your business accounting and like having everything as a business hol holistically g uh, uh, managed as well as the back end of the garden is managed, you know, because it takes all that. Yeah. Without, well, without that, you don't have a garden. Yeah. Or you're back into the basement or back into the garage from a commercial side. You have to have the business side, which is the, the side most of us don't enjoy. I, Do you I en no, I don't. Yeah, um, I don't either. I, I and, and I'm, here's, I'm doing well in, in, the, in business, but it's because I, I learn really quick. I have good mentors and I also hire the right people for the job because, and it's, it take, and sometimes it takes a time. Uh, like I've had to build up to a point where it's like, okay, I can afford the right person, you know, because sometimes you can't afford the right person, right? Because the right person isn't always going to be cheap. Good help isn't cheap. And if you want someone to be excited about what you're doing, you have to, you have to give them some type of motivation. And it's the same thing in cannabis, like incentivizing your growers is probably a really good uh, idea. So if you're a huge commercial farm and you're not doing that and you want to, and, and you want to get, you know, passionate workers that like what they're doing, you have to have some type of motivation for them to, to, to get behind what you're producing. And if you're not producing well, it's hard for the people who are selling product to get behind your product as well, because nobody wants to sell mids, dude. Nobody wants to sell, sell shitty product. They want to be proud of what they're doing. They want to be proud of the work. You know, everybody wants to take pride in what they do. Is that how Bakashi Earthworks was founded out of your basically 10 year 
figuring out how to scale commercial organics? Bokashi Earthworks came out of the same mentality of my 14 year old self that was like, I, I can't afford to um, continue to buy my own weed at 14 years old unless I'm slanging it. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, I didn't sell weed. I only sold weed so I could smoke because I knew that if I had it, my friends would buy it and I could go re up and I'd always have, you know, I'd always have smoke. Um, I was using uh, a product that's no longer on the market. It was a Bokashi product in my garden because I had switched. I, was, I think it was in 2014. My, my boy that taught me, shout out to Dirty Harry, the creator of the Afghani bull rider out of San Diego. Um, he was like, oh, dude, I'm switching to all organic. And he was like all hyping it up. And I got all excited. It was like, dude, I'm going to switch to organic too. And then I switched out my whole garden. I seen him a couple weeks later and he was like, oh, dude, I was, I was just fucking pulling your chain i'm not gonna switch out because he was running <laughs> he was run at that point he had already switched out of hydroponics and what he was a doing cruel joke he yeah. was doing soil but we were still doing fertigation salts i think we were running like house and garden at that time and i was like i'm going all organic and i there was a net there was a necessity for me switching to organic because around that time 2014 2015 um the the market just they started to drop it started to fall out and you know i was it went from like Forty forty eight hundred dollars a pound when I started, and it dropped to forty five, and then it went to like thirty two, and then it went to twenty eight, and then it was at twenty four, and I was like, I got to figure out how to fucking like do this less expensively, and so I switched. I did. I I I switched all organic, and I had a fucking terrible first run. I, the weed was fantastic, the yield sucked, and I was like, I got to figure this out, and I had to relearn everything. So. I started going down massive rabbit holes. I started learning how to read science white papers, reading the science, learning agronomy, learning my microbiology. And I developed, uh, you know, a whole new appreciation because I knew I didn't fucking know anything. I didn't, I didn't know. I knew how to do what I was taught how to do. And I knew, and I had a good solid foundation as far as timing, cloning, pruning, training, all of that stuff solid. And I was able to, take that, but I had to relearn about nutrient dynamics. I had to learn about soils. I had to do everything. I had to learn. I learned about probiotics and microbiology. I was using another product uh, called Grokashi and I was like, this stuff is expensive. And I figured out how to make it. I was like, this is so inexpensive to make. And that's how it kind of got started. My friend, Kathy and Dirty Hair actually originally had started the company and then they were just like, weren't interested in it. I ended up going to prison for manufacturing i was i had a little hash lab long story short i had a neighbor that got a con to a confrontation with another neighbor had nothing to do with me sheriff showed up my up at my house i ended up doing an 18 month prison term on that and when i got out november 6 2018 i went to work for my boys um hardwood flooring company and then my boy uh, dirty harry like after i was like doing that for like eight months he's like yo bro i need you to take over one of my spots um i can't deal with you know my partner anymore can you you know 50 50 you want to do it and i was like fuck flooring i'm there so i i moved into the spot you know set it all up again and i that's when i started to do that's when i found out about instagram and i was like fuck it i'm gonna put myself on blast i gotta figure something out and so I just started putting myself on blast, dude, hard as fuck. And I was like, this is how you do this. And I started doing little educational videos, started doing podcasts. And then uh, somebody noticed me. They invited me out to Oklahoma. They were having issues. And then I got to see the facility and, and they're like, yo, I went out there three days later. They're like, hey, can you do this? I was like, yeah, I'm out of, I'm out of Cali. That's exactly what makes me want to bring up your background. Where'd you grow up? And let's get into a little bit about your background because you're such an informative guy and you're and in my in my eyes in my opinion you're such an important guy in this space because you tell it like it is you talk about it openly you don't harbor the results or harbor this is something accessible through your patreon through you through oh, consulting yeah. through just listening yeah. to you on podcast kashi earthworks.com man um where yeah you i come up? from nothing I, yeah. I come from the gutter uh you have a southern accent I, it's really strange that you say that because I did for a very short period 
um, go back to Illinois to live with my family. So what happened was my mo- I have my mother's life tragic, tragic story. It's a tragic story. But my mom, um, she was almost burned alive. Her stepmother lit her house on fire with her locked in the closet. Uh, I think my aunt, my great aunt, saved her from that scenario, but it messed her up really badly. And so she had a lot of trauma from that. Uh, she was moved around a lot. Uh, because she didn't live with her father or her stepmom who lit the house on fire to begin with. She, when she was young, I think maybe 14 years old, she ran away from Illinois where my, uh, her side of the family was from. She moved out to California. On my dad's side, my dad's family died um, when he was 12. And he's from Cardiff, which is a beach town in San Diego. And he was doing what he could to survive. He started selling Mexican weed and then he started, you know, he learned Spanish and then he got involved with the Mexican mafia. And so he was doing like horseback trips across the border with fucking packs. And he got really, really highly involved with like cocaine, weed, speed. He was supplying bi- uh, a lot of bikers. He was taking shit out to like Michigan with, uh, with one of my OG homeboys, Johnny, <laughs> who's still around. And that's stuff. trippy. You know, the guy that he was working with. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I met all those guys. Yeah. So I, I was taken away from my mother when I was about three and a half. Um, CPS took me away. Uh, that was traumatizing in itself because I was put into a very abusive uh, foster home system. And for anybody who's listening, if you have ever been a victim of abuse during foster care or anything like that because that shit is real there are real people out there who do that type of work so they can harm children it's a real thing that really happens i was a victim of that but there's hope dude because people will tell you that you're fucked up and that you have mental issues but you are you're not alone dude there's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of resources and help find the help because i honestly shouldn't be here i went through massive amount of abuse i was at a foster home that got raided fortunately because there's a lot that didn't and there's a lot of people who didn't make it there's a lot of people who get trafficked there's a lot of really heinous shit that happens in these scenarios i made it out got shut down by cps i went into a couple of different orphanages for a little bit and then i got shot back to illinois i live with my biological grandfather between him and and his sister my great aunt now they, for whatever reason, couldn't keep me and they shot me back into the system. I flew back to California um, where I was born in San Diego and I was put into the foster care system again. Luckily, I was put into a, a more stable environment. How old are you at this time? Uh, before and a half when I go back. Yeah. And I remember all this stuff. So I was really Same. traumatized. I used to have these, uh, these uh, night terrors. Same dream every single day, every single night. And what was so- the dream? Well, the dream was it was an apocalyptic scenario that looked like an amusement park that was kind of, you know, run down and um, there was always wolves chasing me. And I always had to find the man with the gun, right? The man with the gun, the man with the, he had had a shotgun. And interestingly enough, um, I was adopted, but I was in a foster care system my whole life because the lady that adopted me, her son had passed away. So she was traumatized from that. And she was trying to replace that void, which could never be filled. And so I was try, I was, I knew it and I could feel her emotion that she was trying to fill this void that I, I could never fill. And so that fell on me. I felt that. And I always felt so rejected by her, uh, biological children. But then she started getting more foster kids and more fo- foster kids. And she, so we would have foster kids cycling out in, and through these homes. So I was used to a lot of chaos, a lot of mental disabilities, autism, um, dealing PTSD, with personalities, different personalities. Like that was always chaotic. And then we moved constantly. I moved all over San Diego. I probably moved about 22 times at least before the age of, you know, 15. So it was, it was wild in that aspect. And then I was also put on a lot of psychiatric medicine because they told me that I had bipolar schizophrenic disorder. And I was this whole time, they tell me all this stuff. I was being gaslit. I was being gaslit. I didn't know. Don't let anybody ever tell you that stuff. Society is fucked up. 
you know, that's the whole problem. We are so disconnected from reality, which is the soil beneath our feet. We're so disconnected, the majority of us. And that is what causing a lot of the, the, the problems. We're disconnected from healthy soils, which provides nutrition, which fuels our brain, which fuels our consciousness. It's all tied together. Um, I was in this, that scenario for a while. When I turned 14, I smoked weed. I was like, oh shit. It changed my consciousness. And I realized that there were different like levels of consciousness and that you could elevate your consciousness. Psychedelics played a huge part of that for me as well. I stopped taking the pharmaceuticals, which made me feel like a zombie. The last one I think I was on was called Effexor. It was an antipsychotic, but it made me put, put me on autopilot and I had no emotions. I was just walking through life like a zombie and I hated it. I started smoking weed, changed everything. But it also caused a lot of problems as a teenager who wanted to figure everything out because I studied a lot of like ancient history, UFO, numerology, the occult knowledge, right? And I was like, how does all this stuff work? Why do these things work? Why is these certain weird things happening to me if I get, if I concentrate and focus and like, so I'm trying to figure out what's happening to me um, as far as like my, like, you know, being connected to this other thing like in a, a different type of realm. And so all of that happens. I smoke weed and it just changes my perception. And I, you know, I started selling a little bit of weed, support my habit. And it just grew into me wanting to be able to cultivate this plant. I told all my friends when I was in high school, I'm going to be the best grower in the world. I've always strived for that, you know, but so, I don't know if it's a possibility. There's a lot of great, great farmers out there. I look at it like this, and this is where I, I think you touch on it with soil, and I want to touch on a few things, is that it's almost like a life journey. It's like uh, Eero, the guy who does sushi, where he's like 98, and uh, he's still working towards the perfect sushi, and he's like, I'll never get there, but it's always working yeah. towards this goal. Uh, that dream is, it gave me chills. It made me emotional because it's like you're looking for a protector, something I want to touch on. If you do not create purpose for yourself then you can get lost it's very 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 easy to stray from your dreams and your ambitions if you don't they say every journey every thousand mile journey begins with first step single step i studied magic a long long time and it wasn't until my second prison term that I actualized all of the information and put it down in paper. Incantations of what I was going to do. Writ them over and over. I, had a, I built a journal while I was in there on how I was going to get to this point. Everything that I have achieved, I had a five-year plan that I built in there. I achieved it in four years. I make these plans because if you're not thinking long-term what your goals are, you can't manifest that. You have to put it on paper, bringing it to this ethereal realm, putting it into physical reality, and then taking the steps to make, how is it going to happen? What steps are you going to take? Even if you stumble, as long as you're always progressing, I like to think about my game as a role-playing game. I'm the main character and I get to level up. And every time I level up, I get stronger and I get better. The game you're playing gets harder as well. And you couldn't get to that next level without you leveling up, right? It's like you open doors because of you leveling yourself up. Absolutely. And soil science, so incredible because there's so much information that we don't know. You could, I will be spending the rest of my life doing this because there's so much, there's so much information. And there's one of the biggest benefits is a lot of people don't realize that, but this but there are there's so much knowledge information in in books there are scientists that have dedicated their whole entire lives 80 90 years to at the very end of their life write one single book on the accumulation of all their knowledge and that is priceless and you can find all of this information so easy what are a few books that you think every cultivator should read botany for gardeners is a really good one to give you a comprehensive understanding and idea of the functionality of plants and how things work. Beginner books on agronomy. 
very good. Okay. Um, any be organic chemistry. All of these start at the basics. Start at the very basics because a lot of this information, a lot of the books that I have, if I were to hand it to somebody who doesn't have enough experience or knowledge in it, it's going to read like a foreign language. Yeah. A lot of the podcasts will go over people's heads and that's why it's good to dumb it down and then come back to this, right? Like read some of this stuff that Brandon's speaking on and then come back to this podcast and understand it better. You know, if you know nothing about this. Yeah. Let's go back to your childhood and then now you're 14, you start smoking cannabis and you start piecing together why certain things are happening to you or why your life is like this. And then also you trying to figure things out, obviously, is your childhood, you know. Traumas. Yeah. 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 So um the the effect that it gave me opened up my it expanded my consciousness. And so I I understood that the way that I approach almost everything is I try to take a holistic view of it. And it's because of the way that my mind works. It doesn't so much shut off, but it's always kind of cycling through information and picking up on all the pertinent pieces of a puzzle to create a single picture. That's the best way I can describe it. And I don't know if everybody's brain works the same, um, but it allowed me to see that there are different levels and that what society has deemed as normal wasn't maybe for me or maybe that things were out of touch and i couldn't figure out why i felt so out of touch and it it was because i i needed to get my hands in soil i needed to connect with reality because everything around us is is manufactured manufactured cities are can you know are our rights the uh, air the air conditioning the lighting everything yes the only thing in my view that is real is what we can produce ourselves what we can get our hands into the phys like farming is so amazing because you're creating from the soil you're it's i don't understand i don't know how to explain it but for me, it's like the basis of reality. It's like where everything starts, you know, like every, all of our perceptions, all of life, it comes from soil. It's like we, we could not exist. We couldn't be having this conversation. We couldn't be in this, this realm of consciousness without all of the processes that are happening that are fundamental for all life to exist. It's, it's, it's wild. My view is that every single individual consciousness is an expression of the universe. It's like the universe becoming aware of itself is what we are all independently experiencing, but we're not of separate any, like we're all one thing. It's just that we're in a space that seems disconnected from each other and the i think it's just because the way our biology works it's like this is what keeps us here in this plane i'm it's it's hard to explain i guess but how did that how could we be separate from god how could we because if we're i'm, I'm talking about whether your definition of god is like uh my my idea is like the all-encompassing like it's everything it can't be set like nothing can be separate whether it's godhead whether it's all the physical material plus all of the ethereal like it's we're all part of it it's all us it's we're no we're not separate from it you know and kind of thinking that i have on it you know mm -hmm. so it's all going to become one thing again eventually very true yeah and that's got to be tough taking that mindset and ended up going to prison because oh, that's yeah. a place that doesn't flourish off that mindset. No, no, you know. So the reason why I got into the game was because when I turned 18, I got a hold of my mother. And my mother at the time was strung out and she had been, she, she had a hellacious life. It was not easy for her. Uh, her and my dad split when they were really young. In 1996, my dad caught a case. 57 to life in prison. 
So he got into a high speed chase. He shot somebody, killed somebody, got into a high speed chase, ran through police barricades, was shooting at the cops, got to high speed, he got a chase, got into a shootout. And the story's fucking crazy. Um, but he always tells me that he was dosed because there was people in the, the family that wanted his business. And uh, it's a crazy fucking story. But, you know, he swe swears to this day that uh, they dosed him. They dosed, they were dosing the speed. And uh, so he was out of it. I got a hold of him when I was 18. My mom gave me his contact info for prison, in prison, and I wrote to him. And he told me, because I was living in North County, I think it was in Escondido at the time, told me to go back down to El Cajon, where I had lived prior. Um, that's where he was from. Uh, he was from Harbison Canyon, but East County, which is like, you know, uh, Lakeside, Santee, El Cajon, and then you know, Alpine and Harbison Canyon. I got a hold of him. He wrote me back immediately and was like, you need to go see my people. Like, cause he had a bunch of younger friends, which would become my, my OGs, my older homeboys, my, the older guys, you know what I mean? And they had already been cultivating cannabis for like 10 years. He told me who they were. I knew what they were doing, but I got into the business because of them. Cause I was, you know, 18 year old kid. That's what they called me. They just called me the kid. <laughs> um, they had already been doing it for 10 years, but they fucking made me do a bunch of bullshit. I was basically their bitch for fucking months, dude, because they didn't know who the fuck I was, where the fuck. I mean, they knew that I was my dad's kid, and they were all like, holy shit, he looks just like his dad. He's just like Stan. Fucking walks like him, talks like him. And so they're all, tri everybody's tripping on me. Anybody I meet is tripping because they're like, because my dad was like pretty fucking righteous dude. He would help everybody out. Even though he was like slanging mad fucking pounds, he was putting, he was dropping G's on people. Here, dude, take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Do this. People loved him for who people he was. People loved him because even though he was fucking crazy as fuck, he was down for his and he was down for his own, dude. And, you know, he helped all his friends out. And these people took me under their wing because of that. Now, I worked for uh, Triple D and Dirty Harry for months dude and i was washing their dogs i was cutting their weeds down i was washing hydro uh, grow ton you know the hydroponic rock and buckets and i never saw a fucking plant for probably four months maybe even longer and then one day they're like they're like hey you know we got this pad we need to fucking cut open into the galvanized steel pipe so we can steal power because triple d was an electrician and he knew how to do all that shit he's like we'll, we'll pay you two grand if you do it and i was like fuck yeah let's fucking do it because they're like they're not gonna do it because if they fucking nick that hundred thousand volt wire they're fucking dead so i it was the most nerve-wracking thing to this day that i've ever done but they brought me put me in the back of dirty harry's uh chevy uh with a blindfold they took me out to uh lemon grove where the grow house was at and uh they walked me in there blindfolded and then they i remember they stood me right in front of a garden door and they took the blindfold off and then they opened the door and the lights were already on and everything was praying. And at that moment, I was like, I fucking made it because my because my 15 year old self was like. Yes, dude, these are the people that I've been looking for, because always on the hustle, trying to find that good weed, trying to find real chronic because it's all Mexi and pretendies. And, you know, if you could get a good fucking batch of weed, you were fucking stoked. And these guys had the fire. And I was like, I'm at the source. I fucking made it. So I, you know, they showed me the grow and stuff. And they're like, all right, come on, kid. This is what you got to do. I had this little Dremel, uh, Dremel with a little disc, disc on it. And I was <laughs> Dremel in this fucking high voltage pipe. Oh. And I did it, dude. Most, most terrifying thing I've ever done. You I, see one spark, you're like, oh, 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 I know. It was sparking oh, too, because I was bro. so, or, or the disc would break, oh. and it would get stuck in the thing, and I have to change the disc. Oh, my God. It was so nerve-wracking. Damn, dude. I just blasted some punk rock, and I was like, fuck yeah, let's get it done. And I did it, and after I did that, that's when they fucking really brought me in. They're like, you're the fucking you're, you're, the, the kid didn't the quit. Kid. He's got balls. Yeah. He's in. Yeah. yeah. So um, after that, you know, uh, they brought me in and they didn't even pay me money, bro. At this point, they were paying me 300. Uh, They're paying me an ounce a week to work for them. <laughs> and I, I just happened to be 
at that age where I was already slanging weed and I, I was out of high school already because I graduated early. I, I, I only went to 10th grade and then I got a, 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 a diploma mm -hmm. because I got kicked out of school. I hate fucking hated school. I got kicked out of school, went to adult ed, did like three months and I graduated. Which is crazy because most people listening to this would be like, wow, he must have been great at school. Oh no, I was fucking terrible at school. They, dude, they made me go to like a special ed school when I was in fourth grade. But then they, they, then when I was in eighth grade, they did an IQ test and they're like, oh, we don't understand what's going on here. My mom was a special ed teacher, right? Yeah. And then also ESE emotionally disturbed. Yeah. And she used to always say that every child, she's such a compassionate person, my mom, my mother. Uh, she used to say every child learns different. And it doesn't yeah. mean that just because one person learns one way and one learns another way that this person's not as smart as this person. I was bored, dude. And the thing is, is they tested, they tested and they're like, well, he's retaining all the information. He knows everything. He just doesn't do any of the work. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't care about. He's not interested not, in this. I'm not. Yes. It, it, the teachers aren't engaging. Here's the thing. You know what really pisses me off? I'm going to bring this up. I hate it when people say, uh, tell, tell us that kids have ADHD or they can't, they can't function in schools or they're not bullshit. If you give your kid a bowl of fucking sugar in the morning, send them off to school with some dyed purple drink. And then expect them to be able to sit still while they have a teacher who does not engage in the students. The yeah. problem's there. That's and then, why. And then for lunch, they're getting pizza and milk and chocolate milk and all this oh. random stuff. And then back into a classroom for the same. And then why aren't the results here? Yeah. Ridiculous. Can you imagine and then if that was a plan? And then they want to medicate these kids. It's like they medicated myself. She's fucking asinine dude that is not how it works it's you like change them and don't change you instead of changing the system around the children it's change the children around the system and it's not even the teacher's fault these people get paid nothing and they have the most important jobs teachers and farmers are the the, the backbone of our entire country and these are the people that are getting fucked the most yeah agreed and we rely on them the most for our outcomes. I know. Our food and our education. I know. It's really sad. It it's is. It's really sad. It, it bothers me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did the school stuff. I wasn't good at it. They, uh, I'm, I'm, a bright, I'm a bright dude. Um, yeah. I study. I can remember things well. And, you know, I just, I, I relearned everything when I did organics, man. It was, it was. But when you get into this garden and you see these guys are growing hydroponically, this first garden that you yeah, got. Yeah, well, this was just, um, we're talking about 4-H when they, uh, you know, asked for a consult. Oh, I'm talking about when you first got brought into that first cannabis oh, grow. Uh, we were doing, we were doing the old two gallon ebb and flow with yeah. the brain, 55 gallon resi under, you know, um, uh, mixed light. So HPS okay. metal halide checkerboard style. Yeah. What strains were they growing? Purple Kush, Afghani Bull Rider. I, I mean, dude, I grew that Purple Kush for 15 years. That shit paid my bills fucking time and time and time again. They should call you Brandon Purple Kush. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I still had the cut. I did I some know. breeding work with it, but it's, it was great, man. Everybody loved mm -hmm. it. You know, Kush is queen. And what was it like, though? Because that is a weird sentiment that you haven't spoke to your father in a while. He's in jail. You reach out to him and he's- I had never met him. And I actually saw the high speed chase when I was living with at my uh, foster home. It was televised on TV. He was shooting at the police helicopter or the news helicopters live. Oh. And my adopted mom was like, that is your father. And I remember it when I was 12 and I was like, holy shit. And then eight years later, I was in contact with him. I've still never met him, but I talked to him on the phone. You know, I shoot him packages. I do whatever I can. And, you know, hopefully one day he'll be able to get paroled. We're working on that. Um, so, but he's the one that turned me on to all of these guys, all these OGs. And they brought me under their wing. They taught me how to do it. And I worked for those guys. Like I said, I was slinging the weed that I was getting paid for. So, you know, I was selling quarters for like 120 bucks. So I was getting paid, you know, like $480 a week, basically cash. And I was, you know, if I wanted to make extra money, I could just sit there and trim too. I go trim binge, trim, uh, binge for like 18 hours for you know, 18 hours a day for six hours a day, trimming up all their weed. And I'd be like, fuck yeah, I got, I did that for about two years. They showed me the system. And then I ended up, you know, cause I was selling all their weed too, because I was young enough that I was still all connected to the high school kids and all that shit. So I was fucking slanging all this weed. 
And uh, I had some some other kids that were still that just got out of high school and they were sell- selling weed while they were in high school. And so they were moving pounds. And I was like, yo, you guys want to fuck a partner up and we can get our own grow. Uh, Triple D and Harold are moving out of the village. So we had this place called the village, which uh, the band Sprung Monkey used to live in there. And there are these um, they're these like these apartments that face each other and they're just four plexes. And everybody in there was either growing weed or supplying power to grow weed. And so everybody was operating out of that. It's right on, um, I think it was on El Cajon Boulevard or Cuyamaca in El Cajon. <laughs> across the street from the fucking bowling alley right there, the bro- uh, boardwalk. And be- before Harold and Derek got in there, it, I think it was uh, Steve Summers from Sprung Monkey was in there and they were growing weed. And then Harold and Derek moved in there. And then when they got a bigger spot with, uh, with uh, my boy, uh, Boxer, who was doing the P91 stuff, he was doing like 200 lighters when nobody, I was like, biggest fucking systems. Like, I remember when the wildfires happened in 2003, the landlord showed up and entered the house without there and found the grow. And uh, he got a fucking charge for that. But th- that was like, we were doing like, f- uh, you know, we do a house where it'd have three rooms, four lights. We'd have another house, have the same couple apartments with like, uh, here we have two, gr- uh, two rooms here, four lighters, and then one lighter right here with a veg whatever it was but but chris was doing like like 100 200 lighters so he was like the big dog and um so i started working with all of the circle all the people that they were working with i started slaying his weed and you know i just brought on partners they left the village i took it over and my other boy dave rains rest his rest his soul he passed away cannabis meiosis syndrome and uh I just I just started setting up these you know grows and with my partners and then it just I've been doing it ever since I went to prison a couple of times yeah I was about to say so this is all in Southern California yeah down in San Diego because you're known as the guy from Oklahoma yeah I but it's crazy that yeah yeah yeah, it starts in Cali oh yeah I mean San Diego born and raised um but you know I'm so glad that I moved to Oklahoma in 2019 because the market fell out in Cali Oklahoma has less restrictions on your freedoms. It's, I mean, gas over there is still 319 and that doesn't have ethanol in it either. If you want pure gas, you get pure gas. It's like oh, $6 over here. Yeah, 530 to 550 right now in Cali. Yeah, so it's like gas is cheaper. Living expenses are, are less. I bought a house up there for 160 grand with uh, 1.6 acres. I got a horse there, chickens. I got gardens. So I provide for me and my family. Um, it's just different. People are great. And since we have cannabis, it's not like, not like a fucked up place to be, you know, plus it's developed. They have the economy in Oklahoma has boomed because they have a professional basketball team now, the Thunder, which I'm not into sports or anything. I just don't have time for but it. It helps but, the economy and it brings people there, which helps business, which helps you. Yeah. Yeah. With Southern California was your first charge where you went to prison. Was that, if you don't mind talking about yeah, it, yeah. was that, uh, cannabis related yeah uh cultivation sales and theft of electricity were the felonies that stuck but they had me on like i don't know 15 6, 16 different charges it was crazy too because that first one it was because i was i was dating this girl dude and she started fucking a cop dude and they set me up it's a fucking wild ass story i don't want to get into it today but one day i might write a book on that but yeah they i got set up dude i fucking lost everything um and I've, it's happened twice, you know. The OGs around me used to always say the biggest pitfalls. Yeah, women. Bringing people to the grow. Doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. Females, whether it's your girlfriend, even if she hasn't been to the grow. she's. Yeah. And then the third is neighbors. Those are the three biggest pitfalls. A neighbor. Be kind to your neighbors. Yes. And this is what's tough. I mean, I had a neighbor in the past. This is what's crazy. You're, you're up to no good. My neighbor used to hook his hose up to my house and water his lawn and everything he had in his backyard, which was like a rainforest, basically. So I would get these uh, water bills for like three hundred and eighty dollars, five hundred. Shit about that either. Oh, they're going to come out and check the water if you call them and say like, "Hey, something's oh, up yeah, with this, yeah. right?" So, so then I'm like, "Is it a normal? Is that a you know?" You're your first time. You, you're just getting into owning houses and, and doing house shit, and you're like, "Is that a normal water bill? Three hundred, four hundred all?" And then. I came back one day and I, this is random. I go into my backyard and my whole backyard is mushy. Like, and I'm looking around and I realize there's a hose that's not my hose wrapped up to the back of my house and left on. Oh shit. So I, I I didn't suspect anything yet. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So I undo it. I clinch it down, you know, 
and I leave. And then I come back another day to this spot, right? And I see this dude running from my backyard. <laughs> And this is like an old Spanish dude. This isn't like some young kid. This is like, you know, yeah. and I'm like, the fuck is this guy doing? And I, I, what I did, I immediately get out of the car, I walk to the side and it's his hose again. Cause the other hose I'd put in my house. So he had yeah. to go get a new hose. Yeah. It's his hose hooked up to my yard and it's running to, to where he got scared away and just dropped the hose fully run, which I'm guessing is what happened the first time. Yeah. That's why the hose got left on. But this is the type of shit people don't even know. You, it's like. And I'm having to be nice to this fucking guy because I'm afraid that my yeah, what bro, are you gonna do? He's gonna take your water. Is he gonna turn me? Oh, in? he's is for he sure. He's the, the guy that will take your water. Is also the guy that will call the cops. And it's crazy because when I got into this house, the owner, we show up and he's got a broken leg and he's on painkillers. Right. So we knock on the door and I'm with my real estate agent, who's actually my mentor, growing, and he's a real estate agent at the time, and he's like. I guess the guy's not here. He's supposed to meet us. Fuck it. I got the key. Let's go in. We go in and the guy's on the couch in his boxers with a broken leg. And he's like, oh, 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 what's going on? Who are you? And we're like, we have an appointment to see the house to purchase. And he's like, oh, hold on. He's in his And the story he proceeds to tell us is how he broke his leg, falling off a ladder, painting the house. And that then he just got out of jail because he got in a fist fight with the neighbor. Oh. And I'm thinking, this guy's a fucking wackadoo. Like, what is... And then I realized, like, no, my neighbor's yeah. a fucking piece of work, you know? But yeah, this is, I, I tell that story just to tell, like, the shit people used to go through before us having, even now with, with warehouses, yeah. you deal with the same shit still. Yeah, I mean, it was way different, too, because we were all, uh, you know, basically operating clandestinely. So we would always have that fear of, are we being watched? What's going on? Using code, having nicknames, you know, all that stuff was real. And, and we had every right. It wasn't just the we that was making us paranoid, but there was legit, like th that Operation Green Merchant when had the FBI and DEA watching people uh, at the hydro store so that they could follow them to their grows and bust them you know we always thought that was happening and we never had the confirmation right it's like you walk into that grow store and you're looking at the street across and you're like is someone parked over there you think yeah. they're taking pictures yep well i mean w what a better way to catch growers i mean i hate that but and now things are different but yeah just sit it it's the source go to the source and just find out who's and then the bigger the equipment purchase the bigger the grower crazy never use bro. you couldn't use a credit card back then no credit card yep. not even your own car yeah, i remember do giving dudes eighths I and mean, then taking their car to the grocery store and i used to always under the guise of like i just need to use it for moving if that's cool and after a while a couple of the homies were like yeah yeah, yeah. you know like moving just give me the eighth and i would get yeah and then i'd get, bring their car back at the end of the day you know yeah. but even that then i was worried well if they now i need to do a couple laps in my you know it's crazy yeah. how it's evolved and it'd be funny too because like let's say you were riding with somebody and you're like yeah i gotta go to the pad or i gotta go get something picked up they'd be they'd be doing all kinds of crazy maneuvers on their map so that way you could not figure out where their house was even if you were like you know what i mean i've been on many rides like that too where it's like dude we've passed this wendy's four times bro like yeah i've never been asked to get blindfolded other than to go to gross and that just that alone i know a lot of people that are like i'm not getting blindfolded so i can get murdered woods, somewhere in the woods yeah, that's like, how it was back in the day. yeah it is but also the thing too is that you know because of the category that we're put into um you know like with people who are slanging coke and all that other shit a lot of the criminal element came with with that it's just the black market or the traditional market it just came with that association sometimes and so you just have to be fucking careful dude yeah when it comes to cannabis like there's no other business like it because it's so based in culture and community you can't do that with like alcohol like you can have a festival and have alcohol and stuff like that present but nothing's based around like you know like the culture isn't based the music isn't based like we have that type of influence in this industry and so it's a huge factor i mean it's culture mm -hmm. it's culture what's this so ah oh man i can't remember what he put in there i think it's some banana og uh so i've got i've got great people that work with me at bokashi earthworks oh, and great. one of those is my uh my buddy trevor who's uh, dummy grows gem seeker genetics and um you know we do some little projects together on uh seeds and stuff like that and he does his own grow and stuff. tastes and great yeah um he, i 
I smoked all the other joints that I have, but I also <laughs> want to mention uh, all of the members of the Craft Farmers Alliance in Oklahoma. It's an organization that I put together for small owner operators so they could do co-branding and marketing, um, help fight against you know lobbyists, and to uh, do collective. Um, oh, here's a good example: not making making sure nobody's uh, everybody's not growing the same thing, so they're not competing for shelf space. And we have meetings and. Um, they all have like really good high quality products. And the biggest thing I think for owner operators, uh, small time owner operators mm -hmm. is that they spend so much time on their business and they don't have enough time to go out and pound pavement to do sales and stuff like that. It's another part of the business. And so- Or they're not good at it. Some people aren't great at marketing, but are amazing growers. Oh yeah. And so what, what I've done is at the Bokashi Earthworks office, um, I created the Craft Farmers Alliance with the hopes of being able to increase brand awareness and collectively help out a lot of the people that I work with, you know, on a consulting basis or people are using my products and people, some people aren't using my products. Some people, I don't, you know, I don't have to do anything with it, but I know that they have really good product. I know like how they cultivate. I know their SOPs. I understand what they're doing for IPM and I understand the, 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 um, the passion that they have. And so, you know, putting together, you know, marketing material for them, putting together a sales team that is specific. So that way, you know, I had a, a sales team originally come in, recently come in and I saw the product that they had and it wasn't that great. And they weren't really, you know, stoked to stand behind it. And so mm -hmm. saying, Hey, look at, we have product from several different high quality farms that you can go out there and put on the market build a sales team for the whole collective, you know, because a lot of times you don't need a, a eight person sales team for a farm that's not producing hundreds and hundreds of pounds a month, right? If they're small batch and they're doing, you know, 30 pounds a pole, um, and then you have another farm that's doing another 25 pounds a pole, you know, you can, you can, um, have the necessity to have that type of sales team, but just one single farm, farm alone might not have that. And so it just, it just helps overall, I think the farms, uh, and that's what I want to do. Like, again, I said before that my success is based off of the sec success of the people around me. And I want to see everybody succeed, you know, because I know how it is in farming. I've, I've done it for so long. I know how hard this business is. And that's rare. Just that. Being in someone with being in business with someone who actually wants your success, how crazy is that? That that's rare, as well as someone who, even if I'm not growing in soil, even if I'm not an organics guy, you're someone I pay attention to. You're someone I cut because plants uptake nutrients. Doesn't matter whether it's organic or not. Also, plants have issues. And so those issues if you trace them back, it comes from the same source. It comes from the same problems you're having. So I absolutely love your Instagram, bro. I'm like one. And now my next thing is getting on your Patreon because me as a hydroponic grower, I was brought up hydroponically. It's almost like if you're brought up Republican or Democrat, it takes a while before you start to realize other things. And you're like, hold on. Yeah. They're both the same. They're both not for the people. I need to be this. It's the same with cultivation. You might've come up hydroponically or soil or, and then you kind of find your path. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. I prefer working with people with no experience because oftentimes you have to correct bad habits when you're switching stuff over. And that can be difficult. You know, sometimes people get set in their ways and it's hard to break a lot of times uh, habits. And so when I work with younger guys that don't have a lot of experience, it's easier to forget to, for them to follow the directions than it might be for a, a guy who's been doing it for 20 years. Because this is the years. only way to do it now. Well, here's the thing. When we're talking about uh, cultivation of cannabis, we have to do the same thing that is done in every single crop. Whether you're doing it organically or conventionally, you have an agronomist that addresses the, the soil the nutrition of that soil and make sh and the balance of the elements that are in that soil. For me, as an agronomist, I don't just look at, at it from a chemical standpoint because what happens is most agronomists are just looking at the chemical standpoints, the, the chemicals that need to be in there. But the problem is they're not addressing the carbon because as you increase the percentage of carbon in natural soils, you get better microbial activity, better water holding capacity, better uh, ability to create new soils and soilize the, the elements from the parent app of type material that exists in that soil. And so when I'm doing ag recommendations, especially on um, 
like field soils, we're always addressing carbon. And usually we're addressing carbon in the form of composts. We're addressing it in the form of humic and fulvic acids. And I believe that in the future, because the, the, nutri the low nutrient use efficiency for conventional fertilizers, that those fertilizers are going to have to be uh, key carbon chelated. That's what we do with the smart carbon. The smart carbon humate fertilizer is a one part homogenous solution that contains all of the macro, secondary and micronutrients. And it's derived from, um, from uh, organic material that's been mineralized for millions of years. So like we have like coal and oil, all, all coal, oil, lignite, all of those actually come from the breakdown of organic matter. Millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years ago, we had thicker canopies, higher carbon dioxide levels. And so we had like, we literally had complete canopies over certain parts of the globe. And all of those canopies ended up into the earth where they are under extreme pressure pressure and, and ph and so they mineralize they turn into a, basically an organic rock and these organic rocks can be pulled out in the form it's called lignite they can't be used for like energy like coal is used because it doesn't have a high enough carbon content but it has a high enough carbon content and oxygen and um hydrogen that you can take that uh lignite you can micronize it just like they do the parent appetite material for uh phosphorus but then what they do instead of attacking it with uh like a synthetic chemical they use an organic catalyst that changes the ph of that material it causes an exothermic reaction so the uh, humate fertilizer and all uh, humic and fulvic acids real humic and fulvic acids has to be reacted and stabilized if you're buying a uh, product on the shelf that's listed as humic or fulvic acid and the ingredient is leonardonite what that is it's just the mineral uh, material that hasn't been uh, the humic and fulvic acid hasn't actually been extracted so it has a bunch of the human which is just junk that's in that material and so you're not getting the true performance of what you get would get from reacted stabilized humic and fulvic acids and i think there's only one other american company that even makes stabilized reacted uh now, uh, humic acids, I might be bioag. I'm, I, my memory could be a little foggy on that. But with our product, so we have these green manufacturing plants that don't generate any waste because, and all and it's basically we put the lignite in there, put in the organic catalyst, it reacts, causes this exothermic reaction that's actually sustained inside of these, uh, these, uh, uh, titanium alloy, uh, vats. And then everything is blended super, super quick. And what ends up happening is during this process, everything is is energized and so all of the ions the plant available minerals that came from that lignite they bond to the humic uh to the fulvic acid groupings and the humic humic acid groupings. so it carbon chelates all of the mineral ions so if you were to take something like natural uh like magnesium sulfate or something and put it into this solution it'll actually carbon chelate it'll grab onto that and make it an or a new organic molecule so what we're doing is we're taking uh these these unavailable plant minerals that that are formed in this lignite or we can even add other types of minerals to the mix and it'll turn those into a new organic molecule that stays in a bioactive form for the plant and so what that does is it addresses the carbon so every time you add humate fertilizer into the soil you're increasing the percentage of organic matter so you're bioremediating and adding more carbon into the soil at, as opposed to acidifying it when you add in diammonium phosphate into the soil you're you're uh, acidifying the soil and it's as as that car the the carbon is that's in the soil is broken down it off gas as co2 carbon dioxide and so that the reverse of that actually happens where you're retaining more carbon and you're building up the microbiome while also providing metabolically available plant nutrition at the root zone. And so the cool thing is that they also don't react. Like remember how we talked about how uh, the phosphate and uh, fertilizer um, and like d the DAP, if you put it into solution, those ions, they, they, uh, disassociate from each other yeah and now when you put them into your soil they might tie up calcium or magnesium at higher pHs and the lower pHs aluminum magnesium zinc copper that type of stuff that doesn't happen with the humate fertilizer because those reactions aren't possible because those ions are actually attached to a carbon grouping 
And so now they are accessible for diffusion or in mass flow in solution. They're also available to the biology. So all that mineral nutrition can be used by the, by the collectively by the whole system, the biology and the plant. So when you're looking for humic and fulvic acid or humic and fulvic, you don't want leonardite. You no, don't because want it's just, it's just the parent appetite material ground up. It's not stabilized because if you want pure humic and fulvic acids, they have to be pulled out of that material because the, what is responsible for those carbon chains is what's called carboxylic acid, which is a, a carbon to oxygen is a hydrogen group. So what with the Leonardite is like a binder. So it's just a bunch of stuff that's in there. Yeah, wow, there are just some extra of those gunk. There's just a ton of stuff because there's Easter, there's Easters, there's ether, es esters, there's And you don't want those though in your nutrient consumption. Well, you don't need it's it's not gonna do you want the pure humic and fulvic acids because that's gonna stimulate the biology. That's gonna chelate other minerals that are already in the soil. It makes things more bioavailable because you're attaching when you have a, a free liberated phosphate ion, it doesn't exist freely in nature very long. So you have a short period of time and, and a space in the root zone, which happens in the rhizosphere. When, when uh, phosphorus is solubilized, it's solubilized. And when it's solubilized in the rhizosphere, that in that moment, when it's solubilized, the root can diffuse it, right? It can diffuse that uh, phosphate into its, its cells. But if that's happening, let's say freely, not outside of the rhizosphere, there's a good chance that that phosphate anion is going to react with another element and the, the reaction that takes place between which element is pH dependent, right? And so we, when you have the carbon chelation, those reactions don't happen and you're able to keep everything in a metabolically available form. Uh, but the, but, but yeah. So what does that mean for the plant? Well, it means that you have better nutrient use efficiency. When we're talking about 10% of the, 10% of nitrogen that's in the 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, you get 96% nutrient. You get 96%. You flip that on its head. It's, it's completely wow. different. And that's one of the reasons that why if you're fertilizing with um, the humate fertilizer, because although I, ha I, I know that it works in hydroponics, I know it works in other uh, uh, types of systems, but I haven't done enough trial and error on my own re R and D type stuff to be able to give out the types of recommendations I would need to have that system fully functional and to make sure that the plant has everything it needs. In, in, uh, in the soil system though, when we're looking at uh, an agronomic crop like corn or soy, we're only fertilizing the fields with a very small amount because you have greater nutrient use efficiency. So you're using, it's more cost effective because you're using less and it has a better efficiency. In, in, my, cannabi in my cannabis fertigation systems, we only use this humate fertilizer maybe five times through an entire run. It, because it, it's so efficient in the use, we only need to use it once every other week. And that's really just to help push the production side of the organics because if you go and look at my uh I, I posted a story the other day from uh honey hole trav's honey hole and dude he's got massive spears and he and what in the way that we achieve that is just like an agronomist for corn or soy at the very beginning of the run we we bring the soil up to nutritional sufficiency make sure everything's balanced and then we have a fertigation plan okay we're going to use some microbes to help I'll compete pathogens, help with some nutrient cycling, help with some of the production of the metabolites that they produce to help stimulate, you know, the plant. And then we're going to do the humate fertilizers, which is going to really help with the production. It's going to also stimulate biology and it's going to bring in plant available nutrition. And it's also going to help what's already in that soil become more available. Got you. So let me take it back. If I'm a grower, who doesn't, maybe I've been doing hydroponics for a while. Maybe I've tinkered with some cocoa or I've done cocoa, but I've always been a bottled nutrient type of guy. Yeah. How do I start to enter this field without being overwhelmed and feeling like I know nothing and it's going to take me 20 years to get this knowledge to where I'm proficient at this? How do I enter this space? What are the products I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So I've done all of the hard work myself. And that's the reason I've done all the trial and error. I've seen how things function and I can understand how difficult of a journey that can be. But that's why people like myself with 
you know, and my, and my company, Bokashi Earthworks, is able to streamline that process because everything from building SOPs for integrated pest management, fertigation systems, biosecurity, uh, what type of lighting, and are you going to do reheat on your HVAC systems? Are you going to do total, uh, you know, facility automation through GrowLink or some, something like that where you've got soil moisture meters, you've got everything basically on a plan that's built pre-built out and then the computer basically regulates those environmental parameters there's so many different aspects to it and so we have to look at everything holistically but from from a fertigation perspective the the humate fertilizers work across the board in a wide range of conditions as far as soil goes and it has everything already in it you know i if your soil isn't that great to begin with you're still going to get good results but when you're but when you're looking at soil from a testing perspective i use only logan labs for all my data and then when a farm goes and sends off their data and they send it to me i'm able to look at that data and, say, and address every single mineral element with one of the products that we already have that's been independently uh, tested for heavy metals through the university of lafayette in louisiana like we do a lot of extra stuff to ensure quality control especially on the back end because we don't want to have failures for things like heavy metals you know and it does happen but it happens in it also happens in hydroponics you it know definitely I mean? does yeah that's a big thing right now um so we're looking at uh, like my soil the soil that we manufacture and produce it's already agronomically balanced it comes balanced specifically to, to do a run and then once you're done on that run you don't throw it out you just test it test it let's see what we need what the plant took up oftentimes it's you know the nitrogen and then you might need to do some more calcium and, and potassium those are usually the things that are uh, added in the highest quantity as a top dress just to bring that back up to where it needs to be but then you can just keep running that fertigation program which is pretty minimal um i i'm really into the science side and like understanding what you should be doing at what time because that's part of the agronomy you know timing the placement the application those are all factors that contribute to the uh, the end outcome so i like to do things like front loading calcium and nitrogen in veg right we like to get the tissue because you can do more than just a uh, soil test saturated paste you can also do leaf tissue analysis and sap analysis so i'll look at the tissue and see how much uh you know nitrogen calcium is actually making it into the plant you can do those types of testing but i like to front load the nitrogen and calcium and veg and the reason why is because calcium is immobile and you always need enough of it because it can't pull from it can't translocate from the bottom of the plant and then during the bolting also like if you're doing seed starts or clones it's always it's really vital to have a, a adequate amount of phosphorus in the beginning phosphorus calcium and nitrogen now there's an antagonist relationship with phosphorus and calcium because they they bind together so easily especially at higher ph phs but th that's what you want in the beginning at the very beginning stages you want high phosphorus high nitrogen and you need uh, enough calcium now as you move into veg stage you really want to push that nitrogen that calcium and then when you're moving in a transition stage you want to push phos again for the bolting when it's bolting you want to hit hard with calcium and you want to hit hard with calcium probably all the way up to week four there's another trick too if you can if you can de if you can increase your manganese ppm over your iron ppm during the transition phase where your plant is bolting then um you'll be able to have a, a faster onset in flower and, and a faster uh, finish time right because the iron iron is a photosynthetic nutrient um and and then the manganese is more of a reproductive type nutrient right the, the for what metabolically iron does internally with a plant more geared towards veg biomass production so uh, if i'm a cultivator and i want faster onset of flowers yeah you can you can you can if you like here's the thing you're gonna have you can't do this really in hydro because we don't have real life select uh, uh selective ion probes so i have a meter that i can take a soil sample and then i can put i can read for calcium magnesium potassium 
chloride, sodium, nitrate, and ammonium in real time. And it's about three to 5% of what the lab results would also give me. So I can do that in real time. Now, I'm not going to be able to look at iron, manganese, zinc, copper, and some of the other things because the, the technology doesn't exist to be able to gauge with a selective ion probe. Now, a selective ion probes aren't even being used in hydroponics, right? If you could, and it, and it is more difficult uh, to address single mineral nutrients in, in uh, hydroponics because usually like the base for like phosphorus is going to be DAP, diammonium phosphate, or it's going to be uh, phosph um, what are some of the other uh, phosphorus fertilizers? And uh, there's uh, ammonium nitrate, you know, and then there's um, calcium nitrate. There's uh, potassium, pho potassium. potassium phosphate. There's all these different types of chemicals that could be used as a base fertilizer. And oh shit, what was, what was I going with that one? Well, uh, faster onset of flowers and how oh, yeah, we can't yeah. measure them in hydroponics. Yeah, so you can't, you can't really measure those individual ions. Um, so iron and manganese you could do because you can get uh, just a single like chelated EDTA, chelated iron, EDTA, chelated manganese. But you would need to be building your own uh, salt program if you were to do this type of thing. That, and you'd also need to be able to have some type of testing where you'll be able to see the actual PPM of each of those elements as they fall into solution to do so. So we can do that with soil testing with the a saturated paste test. And I can look at the elements uh, uh, as they fall into solution. And so if I was to look at that and I knew bolting was coming up, so I took uh, a soil test a week before I flipped a flower, I get my results and I see where manganese and iron is on my chart and it, and in veg, iron's always going to be higher. So what I do is I look at the amount of manganese that's already there and I increase that over the iron using something like uh, manganese sulfate. And if I do that at, that at the proper time, you're going to see the effect of it. Gotcha. Right? So timing and application are really important when you're doing new, uh, nutritional adjustments. And again, these can be done in hydroponics. They can be done in soil. But the technology, ha we have to have the technology, we have to be have the, the testing met methodologies to be able to look at that data to make the adjustments that are needed. Typically, if I was running, let's say a hydroponic system, uh, let's say we're doing cocoa or even rock, well, it doesn't matter. And we want to, and we want to look at a plant and what it's actually taking up, we can look at a tissue test. So there's no soil to test, but we can look at a tissue test. And I have targets for this, for the genera cannabis right whether it's hemp or uh or a psychoactive thc uh producing varietal i the, the target range is pretty similar now even though different plants will have different nutritional requirements we can use this same type of testing data to define what those requirements are across different cultivars and i'll get into that in a minute but with that but with the leaf tissue it gives you a percentage so if nitrogen is between, if you want nitrogen between two and a half and three and a half percent, then, and it's only at one and a half percent, you know that you're not getting enough nitrogen from your base fertilizer program. So you need to find something that's going to be able to increase the nitrogen. And so you can do that based off of the test. And so you maybe just do a little bit, you know, increase your nitrogen, go and, you know, wait a couple of days, send off another test. If you see that the percentage of nitrogen has increased in the leaf tissue, then you know you're making progress. So if everything is on, if you're looking at a tissue test and your calcium is where it's supposed to be, your nitrogen, your potassium, your phosphorus, all your mic micronutrients, then you know you're, you're going to have healthy, productive, uh, high quality plants. How do we find out where it should be? Um, like where, where our baseline should yeah, be yeah, through yeah. the process. So actually, you can go on. My, I, I have all of my content organized on Patreon because oftentimes on Instagram, people don't go past, uh, you know, and go look at all the stuff. But that's where all of my information is on. So what I've done is on my Patreon, I just organized all of the content. And then when new content comes out, like a podcast, I'll say, okay, here's the podcast. Or if I write an article on you know, blood meal or feather meal or sunflower whole ash and the benefits and what, you know, yada, 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 whatever. I'll write something out, I'll post it, and then I'll organize it into a category. Maybe it's under nutrients, maybe it's under water, maybe it's under 
microbes, you know, but I just kind of organize the content. And where do I find that? Rust, Brandon? Oh, it's a uh, Bokashi Earthworks on the Patreon. But my okay. IG, my IG is the main, is like where I'm most active. And I always, you know, talk to people and help people answer questions as best as I, best I can. Um, but rust.brandon on IG and then Bokashi Earthworks also IG, Facebook. Um, and I can get to that Patreon link and I can access this information. Not through the social media. I yeah. hate post it up sometimes on my feed, but I'm not like always like pushing it. Yeah. Probably like I should be. But so Bakashi Earthworks.com is the, is the best place to go. Then that's get on for the, the website for the Patreon. Just go to search Bakashi Earthworks on okay. Patreon. Yeah. Um, but I you give made, out so much information. Yeah. And bro. those targets are available. So like, so you can have the target, right? I don't, it doesn't give you the keys to the castle, so to speak, and and knowing how much of what you need to add to get to the target, right? Um, basically, it's just numbers floating in space to most people because they don't have a, a, anything to correlate it to. So if, and that's the same thing with different labs. So if I go to a different lab and someone gives me a report from A and L Laboratories, I tell them, "Hey, look, I need labs from Logan Labs. One because it gives me more data sets." It also is where all of the targets are based off of. So I'm not going to use another lab because other labs testing methodologies, their SOPs and how they test are going to be different. It's going to give a different result. The control is not there. Yeah. There's no control. And yeah. so all of the, all of the, the, the data and the data sets have been off of a single lab. So that's why I exclusively use that lab. And I use that lab for all of the testing and because they're consistent. Um, so leaf tissue targets and this is something all growers can do this isn't just related to soil no 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 Every, look if you're in a hydroponic setting and you really want to dial in a specific cultivars nutrition this is how or i do cocoa. it cocoa yeah or cocoa anything um this is how i would do it in soil it's different from soil versus hydroponics in soil i take four different tests and i like to test about three times per for a full run um if i have a variety that's like a staple in my garden i know that this um hawaiian ice let's say hawaiian ice you're branding it as hawaiian ice you got the marketing you got the packaging this is going to be a staple in our garden for the next two to five years right i'm going to want to build out an sop uh nutritional sop for that cultivar in soil what we do is we do a standard soil test that gives us the general information on what's there the saturated paste test which tells us exactly what our ppm and of each individual element as it's falling into solution and then we can do leaf tissue analysis which tells us how much of what's falling into the solution is making it into the plant tissue and then we can look at sap analysis, which shows us how the plant is actually moving mobile nutrients from lower parts of the plant to the tops of the plant to make up for deficiencies that are not uh, falling into solution. So the way that it works is if you have a mobile nutrient like nitrogen or magnesium or phosphorus, it'll actually catabolize the bottom parts of itself to translocate those elements to a part that is developing. And the reason why it catabolizes itself is because you don't have the proper amount of um, ions that the plant needs in solution, right? So if you're able to dial in your solution and get all the ions that it needs, the plant is basically fulfilling all of its needs for all of its mineral nutrition across the whole part of the plant. It's not just being translocated into the tops. And so I can get a, a, a sap analysis, which is actually two tests. You're looking at fully photosynthetic top leaves that are mature and fully photosynthetic bottom leaves that are also mature. And the two different tests show the amount in the bottom versus the top, and it'll graph it out for you to show you that, oh, nitrogen is being pulled, and it looks like you're about 10% uh, deficient. Now, a deficiency symptom won't typically express itself as a symptom until it's about 50% into that, into that deficiency, right? And so with a SAP analysis, you, you can actually look and address those issues before they ever physically express themselves. So it's like preemptively addressing issues because you know that if you don't change something, 
you're going to be deficient in nitrogen or you're going to be deficient in potassium and your plant uh, is not going to be able to uh, maximize its genetic expressions because you're lacking in the nutrition that that plant needs. Can you imagine? That's like saying <clears throat> I have a vehicle Yep. and I'm not going to know I'm burning through fuel until I'm 50% 50 loss. And if you're and if you're on a, on, a, on a long trek here, yes, you know, and there's no gas station, and oh shit, you're it, it pops up that oh I'm fifth year you only got uh, half a tank, but you've got 500 miles to the next gas station, and you won't know that till it's time. And so most people address nutrient deficiencies as they appear. Of course, yeah. The thing is, you don't have to. You can use data. That's why I say. That's why I call this data driven agronomy because you can address issues before they actually appear and so uh, a good example for like magnesium if you knew if you know that if you do four testing and you map out a cultivar a good um, example of this is my death breath my death breath is purple kush crossed my lime arilla which is gorilla glue four and black lime reserve I did a whole mapping on the nutritional profile and was able to see that it needed less nitrogen it needed more phosphorus and it needed less calcium awesome i can dial in the nutritional profile and the way i did that is again i look at the the amount of nutrition that's falling into solution from the soil and then looking at how much of that's making into tissue if i'm on target or if if my solution is on target but i'm deficient as a percentage of my tissue i know i need to change the target for the solution so i need to increase magnesium for this particular maybe i need or i need to uh, increase uh, nitrogen for for the death breath because it's showing that it only has maybe 1% magnesium and it should be, you know, one and a half or whatever that target was that's on the tissue. It wasn't meeting it. So I know I increased that on solution. Now it'll address that. And then I can, and then to verify that, we'll look at the SAP analysis to see if, if that's, if it's happening. Man, this is huge because <clears throat> to be able to run, a lot of growers will just tailor their feed schedule, not so much their feed or maybe part of their feed, but what they're not doing is testing the plant strain by strain yeah. to see what the optimal feed yeah. would be for that plant. Where like- and That's what I do. I mean, that's huge. But that's not just what I do. That's what is done across the board in, in agronomy. Dialing in strains, but going from bro science to real science. Because people will be like, oh, I'm dialing in the strain, which just means you're playing with the feed and playing with the how many feet times and how much feed is actually getting to the plant. So cannabis will become more of an agricultural commodity as we progress. And then once federal legislation opens up even more so. And when we're talking about agricultural commodities, we are going to see the science that's backed that's backed with that so all of the universities will do independent studies and they'll come up with targets for tissue and soil and this and that and they're doing that currently now but all that's happening is they're just um giving me confirm confirmation on what i already know and basically saying and it, you know basically like yep he already did this years ago and now here's the confirmation here's the validation that it's work that this is why this works or this is you know the right target to be in tune with the culture though and to know you've done this across how many different strains across how many different cultivate they almost have like i'm guessing they're bringing in one strain at a time or a few strains at a time and they're testing it like that the almost like in the trenches work you're doing right now is hard to i mean they got to be what 20 years behind 15 years behind? Yeah, probably about 10. 10. But it depends on how fast they progress because here's the thing. There's like, so, it's so funny when I see a study that's like, oh, we found that the correct parts per million for FOSS is like 30. But it's like, okay, well, you have to take into consideration all of the other things like how much of that FOSS is actually remaining in ionic form for the uh, plant to take up as opposed to, um, bonding with another element so they, there's all these different factors that a lot of times they're not taking in, into consideration and then they're also not taking into consideration things like oh well they might say that 240 uh uh or let's say this is 200 an easy number 200 ppm of nitrogen is too much right but 
it's like, well, it might not be too much if it's balanced out with 400 ppm of calcium and maybe like 52 ppm of it's like if your magnesium is low all the other elements are low calcium is low but only nitrogen is high you're gonna have you know you're gonna see a negative impact but if you're able to create balance with those nutrients even at higher levels you'll see greater results so you there's a wide range of like you know let's say ppms you can operate and get great huge yields and have and only be operating at 800 ppm and then you could be at you know 1600 ppm and still see the same rate same quality but it's it's because of the balance of the nutrients with each other that that helps that and so a lot of times they're not taking in a consideration uh, like a holistic approach they're only looking at it from a chemistry standpoint and they're not looking at it uh or from a, like a sufficiency point as far as how do these things work cohesively together? How is their synergy? How is their antagonisms? And so I, all that work's already been done through, through data and through, my, through myself. And here's the thing. Most people don't need to go and do a crazy extensive testing. You know, it's, I did it because I wanted to see how this worked. And I wanted to be able to say, hey, look, I know how to do this. This is a service that I can offer. If you guys are wanting this, we can dial in a variety and we can say, hey, look, dude, this is what we need here, you know, and then we can address it with all the different types of inputs that are available. Like if, if it's something like everything is on point, but the only thing we need to do is increase like copper and iron, right? Those, cause those things are, you, you know, the, the, the way that the, the dynamics for the oxidation and redox potentials for those different elements work to be able to uh, uh, stay in a metabolically available form, it, it's difficult, right? And so we can address something like with a chelated, a naturally chelated, like amino chelated iron that say, okay, hey, if we do a foiler application of this, because we're seeing that iron is, is low at a certain stage, you just implement that into your SOP program, right? So, okay, hey, we're going to do our standard fertigation program, but for this specific, for this specific variety, we have this additional part of our SOP and our feeding program that allows to maximize the potential for this plant so that we, we increase our yields and we're getting, you know, we're knocking up our, our THC percentage by 3% what are, or whatever it might be. Or maybe we're knocking up our, our terpene percentage by 1.5%. It's just, there's a bunch of different nuances that happen between um, soil biology, uh, the interactions between uh, nutrients chemically and biologically and what a plant actually wants and needs, you know? So all of those small nuances can really, um, you can really, if you understand those things, you can really dial in the quality. And obviously if you're building a brand, the consistency, because that's the biggest part. And I think I tell this people, I tell this people all the time, like, yes, strive for, strive for perfection, right? Strive for perfection, but just be consistent. Because as long as you're consistent, you can at least build a brand because we know tons of brands in the world who don't necessarily have great products, but we know that if we go to this place, the product is always going to be the same. If we buy it across the town, it's going to be the, you know, that's how brands are built on inconsistency. Taco Bell. Yeah. It's, it's consistently <laughs> it's crap. Consi yes, exactly. But it's consistent. And you know what to expect. Like, you yeah. know that if you drink Budweiser and eat Taco Bell, you're going to be sitting on the, sh the shitter the next day. Yes. You know, it's just, we, we, there's consistencies. It's, yeah. it's, it's consistent, <laughs> dude. So that's one of the biggest parts. And, you know, all of the stuff that we're talking about, all of these different nuances, nutrient dynamics, biological crop steering, which I didn't even touch on that, but. One of the things that I created. How is that different from regular crop steering? Okay, so regular crop steering. So explaining biological crop steering and regular crop steering. Yes, so regular crop steering is obviously, you know, steering your, in, your environment, right, is one factor of it. Also, your fertigation plans, doing your drybacks, the reasons why we want these things to happen, right? Oh, okay, so when you dry back your media, you get a, a spike in EC, which means you're getting more ions per water which is doing a certain type of internal thing to the plant. Um, obviously, environmental plays a huge thing with precipitation, translocation of elements and water through the plant. These are all uh, aspects that are all tied in to getting greater production capacity. And we're not addressing 
the biological part so much when we're doing our crop steering and hydroponics it's more environment and then uh and then your fertigation plan right and you're doing your drybacks when we're talking about soil biological crop steering uh there's a little triangle and at the top of this triangle is carbon there's carbon and then there's there's nitrogen and phosphorus so for all life carbon-based life is obviously based off of carbon now we also need nitrogen and we also need phosphorus. Carbon bond, you know, if you have carbon that's bonded with nitrogen, that's what creates uh, amino acids, proteins, DNA. It, 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 that creates the 3D construction of our reality, of all of our biology, biological reality is proteins, right? Because they fold. Their molecules, most things are linear when we're talking about the small scales of these things and they fold in on each other to make three, di three dimensional uh, space. And so that's nitrogen. That's one of the responsibilities of nitrogen. Nitrogen and carbon create proteins. They also are responsible for things like chlorophyll production, yada, yada. On the other side of that, you have um, phosphorus. Now phosphorus is responsible for fat and lipid production also attached to carbon these these organic molecules are making the structural components of cells and the lignin and cellulose that are creating biology it's the 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 they're taking the proteins from the that that are being created with carbon and nitrogen and they're turning them into fats and lipids to build their their components so it's not just plants, but biology needs these things too. They need carbon, they need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, and they need sulfur. They need these elemental ions, same as the plant. And in these, these systems, the nitrogen is highly dependent on biological cycling. So the nitrogen cycle and denitri denitrification is constantly happening. So being able to address that from a biological standpoint, like using flocculative anaerobes which are anaerobes that operate in high oxygen or low oxygen condition they can help proliferate other organisms that will uh convert atmospheric nitrogen into plant available nitrogen and they also do it themselves okay so that's one of the things now phosphorus the plant available ion it doesn't really exist freely in nature for very long because of its highly reactive nature right as a chemical it's super highly reactive and so it once it's liberated from whatever appetite material or liberated from organic material it's it's can it's used in the construction of those those um those components it's also used for energy production and so you need the carbon and the nitrogen and the phosphorus for natural cycling for the biology to do the other things that are going to be beneficial to the plant, right? Soluble of phosphorus is one of those things because all organisms need phosphorus for energy metabolism. And so pretty much every single uh, microbe produces phosphatase, which is an enzyme that solubilizes phosphate from phosphorus appetite material in soils. So it liberates that it becomes available if it's happening in the in the rhizosphere the plant can diffuse it across the membrane it's highly biological process when you increase the carbon you're going to get the bet you're going to get better proliferation of the biology in the soil which are going to make more phosphatases more plant phytohormones more organic acids more uh, amino acids more uh, bioactive compounds more antibiot antibiotics that outcompete pathogens more antifungal properties more antioxidants which reduces oxidative stress from um oxygen free radical oxygen molecules which destroy you know cellular membranes and it's it's what's happening inside the soil to elicit certain biological chemical response responses so using uh like the the microbe plus for instance um what we're going to do is we're going to be able to solubilize a lot more phosphorus and make micronutrients more available the stuff that's already in the soil might not always be available but when we use it it increases the av availability because those microbes are producing secondary metabolites that are things like that chelate minerals right they produce sediophores which are secondary metabolites 
that will chelate those micronutrients, making them more available. They'll produce those phosphatase enzymes, which solubilizes phosphorus, making it more available to the plant. That's part of the biological mechanisms that we're inducing that we're actually being able to see on data. <clears throat> Another one is going to be uh, Bacillus subtilis and trichoderma. Now, Bacillus subtilis is a bacteria and the trichoderma is a fungus. Now, we're looking at, when we're looking at biological crop steering, we're looking at model organisms that are used in science for the production of a certain metabolite. So, uh, for cannabis would be a model um for thc production or cbd production or terpene? production or terpene production right because they have such a wide array and they produce produce them in such an abundance same can be said for microbiology there are model organisms that produce you know the, a maximum amount of sediophores or um, the, a maximum amount of phosphatase enzymes or a maximum amount of endoacetic acid phytohormones whatever it is and so we can figure out which organisms we can add at what time to induce a biochemical response. In this case, if we take uh, Bacillus subtilis and trichoderma, the metabolites that they produce are both so similar and then they act, they act synergistically. So the bacteria will actually grow on the fungal filaments that the trichoderma produce and they'll coexist and cohabitate in a synergistic relationship with the root of the plant. And so the plant is going to release these carbon compounds that the trichoderma and bacillus can feed on and the bacillus and the trichoderma both have really high affinity for iron. Now, iron in organic systems or even hydroponic systems, the reason why it's always chelated EDATA, EDTA chelation in hydro or conventional fertilizers is because it's so highly reactive. It oxidizes so quick into a plant unavailable form that it's just never available. Now, to mediate this type of response in organic soils, we're introducing the type of biology that is going to create the maximum amount of sediophore production to chelate iron and keep it in a bioavailable form. And so when you're in a vegetative phase of high intense growth, you're going to want a, a, a good amount, one ppm of iron availability in your solution. Now, how are you going to do that? You can add in something like iron sulfate right which is ferric iron it's a plant available form but the problem is it's so highly reactive as soon as you put that ferric iron in water it starts to oxidize because there's so much oxygen in the water it just immediately transfers its, its electrons and turns it into its trivalent form and it needs to be in its divalent form to be available so iron has this the, the this chemical and physical property associated that's that's physics and chemistry that it becomes highly biologically unavailable. And so microorganisms have built these metabolic processes in which they can create compounds to make that and keep them in an available form. So we're adding these types of biology at this certain times to elicit that response. And so if I was to inoculate with that consortium into a soil and then have a control, what I'm going to see is higher solubility of iron on the one that's been inoculated versus the uninoculated control. And then you can start to test the variations of terpenes, THC, all that stuff. Yes. There's other, Very there's other, um, there's other benefits too, because you know, trichoderma is a ferocious eater and, and, and one of the things is because it is, is such, has such a high affinity for iron, it just consumes all the iron, which other microorganisms also need that iron. So they outcompete them just through the other organisms not having access to resources. Would this parallel also fruit with BRICS levels? Saying if I'm trying to get an, cause like THC and terpenes for me with cannabis would be like chasing yeah. a BRICS level or a, fl you know, flavor and BRICS, a few different things, terpenes and BRICS level on fruit, like a dragon fruit yeah. or an orange yeah. or an That's, apple. So when we're addressing BRICS, we're talking about complex sugars and the amount of protein, amino acids, uh, stored carbohydrates, the things that the plant will actually store because it has enough abundance of them. And so the, obviously that means you're getting a healthier product, healthier produce, right? Same kind of uh, thinking can be applied because if you have all of the right mineral nutrition, you're going to have better ability to synthesize those organic molecules that the plant internally makes, which include the secondary metabolites that we are so fond of. They would have told us plant biology, 
uh, maybe micromolecular biology, things like that. What would you say these days if I want to get if I want to be a grower of cannabis for my living and not not just soil, any just cultivation in general? I would recommend you go be some OG's bitch for a couple of months. <laughs> I did not expect that. Uh, I did not expect the, that. The, be- the, best, the best knowledge comes from experience. And because the fact that most colleges are behind on the science, especially when it comes to sustainable or regenerative agricultural practices, um, you're going to probably be taught conventional agricultural methodologies. And while you can get good foundations, uh, from colleges and stuff. If you're going to go that route, I would highly recommend agronomy with a a focus on microbiology, biochemistry, and uh, sustainable agricultural design. Because you have to be able to take a holistic approach when it comes to agriculture. Because again, everything is going to change regardless of whether you like it or not. And in the future those phosphorus fertilizers that everybody loves so much are going to become more, uh, they're going to increase in cost. We're also looking at, again, the efficiencies of those systems. That is the most important part because we don't need to be uh, wasteful. It all comes down to energy conservation and energy allocation. If, If it's more efficient to grow organic, should it be more expensive? No. No, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It's the, the issue is that um, the agricultural business model is broken. You know, I'll give you an example. The majority of American farmers will mortgage their house, their property, and everything they own so that way they can get the funds to grow another crop for another year. This is a perpetuated cycle that has been put together by finance and big ag. Now it works. It feeds people. Industrial ag- agriculture has exploded across the globe, but the, but the thing is, it's not in, it's not like a, and then we have government subsidies too, that, that subsidize farming business models and sustainable. We need to encourage vertically integrated farming systems, but the, but the reliance on, Big like chemical agricultures, in, uh, banking finance. It puts a lot of farmers in a negative position because if they've leveraged everything they own to get the fertilizers, to fix their tractors, if something fails, something goes wrong, their livelihoods are are gone, and that's why the suicide rate amongst farmers is so high. Typical, typically high, like higher than any other class of people. But also the the, the happiness. Of, of those people are also exponentially higher as well, you know, if when they're successful. Now, if we can create vertically integrated business models where we can do practices to help people transition from conventionally based fertilizers to or uh, to carbon based fertilizers, we can help build soil, but also we want to want to implement different agriculture practices like crop covering, adding organic matter to the soil instead of just adding in ag chemicals, whether they're um, natural salts, whether organic meals or they're synthetically created, because we need to be addressing the carbon. We need to be addressing, um, you know, the the fact that we can build soils instead of just always pulling from them. You know, using crop covers, using different types of practices, inoculating with microbes. Those are all things that can be implemented at, at scale, not just in cannabis, but all ag. And then for the for the farmer to be able to like have a business model, maybe someone's a tomato farmer, but they're not just growing tomatoes, but maybe they're also producing tomato sauce and they have a factory on site. And then they're also taking all of their biomass green waste from the production of tomatoes, their stems, their stalks, all of that stuff, all bad fruit sets. And they are making bio fertilizers out of those that go back into the system. So, you know, I work with NASA agricultural technologies. My my mentor, mentor, Dr. George, he has an est- uh, astronautical engineering degree, and he worked on the Apollo space project in the 60s, and then he went into agriculture. He's the one who developed the chemistry. He engineered and designed the, the facilities, and he does all the manufacturing for the smart carbon, the, the humate fertilizer. He created it in the 80s. Monsanto, at one point, tried to buy him out so that they could shelf it. Um, he's taken it to multiple countries across world and it's addressing all of the issues that we're talking about right carbon-based fertilizers increasing car- soil carbon levels um 
it's it's a uh, and there and we're working on you know developing these type of like integrated vertically integrated farming business models to where you can create your own fertilizers on site right how does that look like at scale because the thing is you have to make viable businesses you can't just be a dreamer right because there's a lot of dreamers there's a lot of people who are screaming at walls regenerative agro this 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 and they're also some of the most egotistical people who are who aren't actually putting in work you know it's the application and doing it that that makes things better and and trying to figure out solutions to integrate better practices, right? And that's what I'm trying to do. So that way we can take conventional farming methods and, and, and shift our focus. So that way we have better healthy people, we have higher nutritional uh, densities in our foods. And, and, we're cre and we're trying to create and design with Dr. George and NASA Agricultural Technologies, these types of systems to where we can take green waste recycling and integrate that into farming practices and integrate the production of food into product development and <clears throat> SKUs that can go directly to consumer as opposed to having some huge corporation buy up all the cotton or all the corn at a lower price and that's only that that's what you're going to get you, there's no independent free markets there's only maybe three companies that controls all of the production when it comes to the fertilizer production and distribution and then actually taking the end product right so wouldn't it be great to see um companies that offer all different types of services that can help build out those types of business models because if you can engineer those types of things if you can develop them design them manufacture them and then implement them in a way that is cost effective energy efficient and that that functions properly it's a win-win because we're we're remediating, we're creating economic growth, we're we're creating independence. I mean, I know for me, the reason why I love cannabis so much is because it gave me actual independence, independence, self-sufficiency. I'm not relying on uh, somebody to provide me with work or a job. I'm producing my own product that has its own uh, uh a value to it that is not just monetary but could be traded i could produce this on my own land like the american dream i feel like cannabis has is the last the last piece of the real american dream where yeah it was outlaw but you weren't getting taxed that's un-american to have to pay what we're all paying into it you know especially when all these fucking idiots are spending money on shit that many of us would not allow oh billions going overseas right now Billion. Oh. we have nothing to say about it yeah money going to ukraine the we're almost capped at we're spending more on ukraine than we did on afghanistan it's unbelievable in about a quarter to one-fifth the time when we are able to empower small businesses when we're in, uh, in able to empower American manufacturing, American production. Doesn't matter if it's farming and agriculture, agricultural products, manufacturing for technologies, manufacturing for fertilizers. Those things collectively strengthen our country. And when those aren't controlled in the hands of a few people, there's economic boom and development and prosperity amongst a wider range of people, which is what we want to see. We don't want, I don't want to see the wealthiest people controlling everything in the world, telling me what I need to be doing and, and my what you should be making. Look at, like we were talking about how everything in this world is manufactured. Now we have these manufactured rights as well. And it's only collectively, if we group together that we retain these things and it's the ideas that we collectively have together that give us those, those freedoms and those independences. And real freedom and independence comes from self-sufficiency. That's why owning your own piece of land has always been the American dream. Because on that land, if you know what you can, if you know what you're doing, you can produce a viable income independently, tax-free. And that's what cannabis offered for so long. I'm no longer in that space now. I am now playing a game, a game of manufactured consent, a game of uh, a game of you know f uh, f f fiat finance and in a game of fiat law and if you can play it just like that rpg uh role-playing character where you're leveling up through all of it and you can navigate it you can do it and put yourself into a position to make real change 
because I was one of those people who were like, this is better. This shouldn't be. This is the way things should be. Blah, 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 blah. You can yell at the fucking wall all you want, but unless you take, unless you take decisive action to be an implement of change, then nothing's going to get done. It's That's just why talk. This, that is yeah, why to, to every th- time I, a, a door of opportunity presents itself, I walk through that door. The reason is because when, when Dr. George called me to explain to me what the smart carbon humate fertilizer, and he was impressed with my, my knowledge and, and my skill set in, in agriculture, he invited me to NASA Agriculture Technologies in Chicago. This is about maybe two years ago, maybe a little bit more. But since then, he has guided me so much. And this is one of the products. This is a, Yeah, talk about it. Dude, okay, so check this out. I'm going to leave these here with you too. You can use I appreciate leave it, that. Leave it as a little trophy. I'm, that or I'm about to use it because I, I transplant plants into cocoa right now. I'd love to use it. I love this. This is so cool. So the Nutri-Grow pot is um, a system that's going to take the world by storm. And it's a replacement for single use plastics and a replacement for starter fertilizer. So this cup right here that can be created in any size, it's this prototype is built out of manure compost coated in the smart carbon humate fertilizer. So it is 66% organic matter. And then it's all chelated micro uh, chelated mineral nutrition. So what will happen is, and st- if you were to go to a nursery, Home Depot, uh, Walmart, whatever it is, and you go buy a tomato, you're going to get up a starter plant that comes in a little plastic cup. And then you're going to have to tra- uh, disturb the roots, transplant that thing. And then you're going to have to put fertilizer on it. With this, you don't have to do this. This will come. You can germinate a seed. A nursery could germinate a seed in this. It'll actually grow in the cup. The cup will actually release the mineral ions to the plant right at the root zone where it needs it. You don't have to pull the root out or transplant it. You just transplant the whole thing. And then you don't have to fertilize after because this cup breaks down right at the root zone, delivering both carbon and the ions that the plant needs. So it's going to proliferate the soil microbiology. It's going to help with water retention. And you're not going to have the labor associated with um, going and have to go and fertilize after you've done your transplanting on your fields or in whatever type of application you're using it. This is game changer because plastics are, are out the window. Everybody knows that as we move into the future and all these new regulations and stuff happen, we have better technologies to move forward. And it's about implementing these technologies for the improvement of our soils that we're going to see improvement in mental health. We're going to see improvement in the, and that's going to do a direct correlation to the amount of mineral nutrition that we have in our food. Healthier food make healthier people. A hundred percent. If you could leave people with one or two pieces of advice, what would it be? Maybe one for growers and one for non-growers. Okay. For the non-growers, anybody who's not a grower, I highly recommend you give it a shot. Do it. Just do it. Because oftentimes, even if you fail once, you fail twice, the process of growth and learning can often be just as therapeutic as the actual medicine. Being able to care and provide for something and then reaping the rewards of your hard work and your intuition and putting your energy and love and compassion into something is so highly rewarding. When you're able to nourish something and watch it grow, it's rewarding. On the reverse of that, it can also be detrimental if things are going wrong and you get down on yourself, it's often a good idea to look at it from an outside perspective, the yin and yang, there's the, going to be the good and bad. The only thing that you have the ability to change is your outlook on it, right? So try cultivating. It's therapeutic. I think it's just really psychological when you come down to it, because there is a connection that we have between nature and the planet. And I'm not trying to sound too hippie here yeah. or anything like that but we're all the science proves it you know we are all essentially connected um so what if, for the grower yes biggest advice is always don't have an idea don't have ideas or don't have beliefs don't have beliefs have ideas because a belief will put you in a in a box if you're able to have ideas you can always change those ideas. You can always grow. And if you get set in a belief system, 
then it's going to be really hard to change. Always be open to listening and taking feedback. And, and, and for everybody, don't be too hard on yourselves because we are all navigating a very, very complex space. Where could they find you and where can they connect with you? If I want to talk, to, if I want to have you come out to our garden and help us with our cultivation, if I want to just talk to you about how do I reach out to you? Where do I find you? So you can find me on Instagram at rust, R-U-S-T dot Brandon. Also, Bokashi Earthworks. Um, I always read my messages. I always try to help out. Uh, you can also check out the website www.bokashieearthworks.com. Um, there's a consulting page where you can put in your information, contact information, and we'll always be in, in touch. One of the things I also do is, again, I'm really passionate about making sure that people are, are successful. So I, I often go out of my way to answer questions and help wherever I can so people can get to the point the, where they need to be. Um, but I mean, I love everything about this space, man. I, I, I love cannabis. It's great medicine. It's given me guidance in dark places. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that I think, uh, I don't take it. I don't take it for granted at all. And, and, and Purpose. being, and, and from where I've come from to where I am now, I always, I carry a lot of gratitude and I'm, I'm proud of myself, you know, and I don't think it's a bad thing or negative thing to be proud of yourself, especially if you can push through trauma and turmoil to basically level up your character. Now, it's really important. It's always going to help people build each other up, dude, because here's the thing, all this lack of community, all the lack of, and I get it, we're all in it trying to navigate this complex reality but it's only when we collectively work and act together and that we're able to really achieve what we need and not get run over by legislative bodies crooked politicians people in places of power whether that's in law or finance to dictate our actions where we can go what we can see i mean it's one of those it's just like we talk about it's all connected it really is all connected. And like, I, I've been pushing for this episode for like three, four months. I was super stoked when you, you were like, I'm actually going to come into town. I'll be there. Let's do this. And it's also why we literally took this podcast to the point where you have to catch a flight and you have like 15 minutes to cap this <laughs> off and head to the airport, bro. I, I really appreciate you making time for us. And a lot of times we get cultivators on here that there's a lot of bro science or hustlers and things like that. Yeah. I really appreciate you sitting down and giving us, in my opinion, PhD level science behind uh, a lot of our cultivators who we just been doing it for 20 years and we use bro science to get by and create businesses around. And now we're actually being able to tailor science and get connected with guys like you. Yeah. I think that for people who have been in this industry for a really long time, I feel like they could be the best cultivator. They could be producing amazing product consistently. They might not be the best businessmen. They might not be the best at the science, which isn't an issue, right? Because there's always options. There's always help if you're willing to look for it, willing to find it. And it's been my, it's been my experience that those that reach out for help usually find the most success because they let go of the ego. You know, that's a lot of us have developed, myself included, over years of doing this and, you know, how we used to operate and stuff. So, um, but also when it comes to, you know, the future of this, big money is coming in, whether we not like it or not, we see it all over the place and it's going to continue to happen once federal le legislation happens. So, I want to see people succeed. I want to see small owner operators because. If we can get them to succeed, there's a balance. You know, you have to create balance because there is going to always be a consumer market who is looking at the bottom dollar of product and don't care so much about who grew it, why this is better. Or the, you know, you know they're just looking at a the tomato is a tomato to them. Exactly. 
you know, and so they're not looking at the nuances that come along with cannabis. And um, for for uh, an ag crop and from a, from a business perspective, we need to be able to educate ourselves so that way when big business is coming in, um, other people have the opportunity. Look at, here's the thing, because <sighs> there's the political side. There's a political side of this too, right? Where it's like big money interests are trying to you know, push smaller players out, right? If the player, small players can be more successful, they have, they can collectively fight back, right? So there's that aspect. But we have to but, be together but, in this. Yeah. But there's also the fact that if, if you're, you know, uh, if you've been doing this and you do create a product, but you're able to like sit down with somebody and say, look at, here's the results. This is what we're doing. You can go and start your own growth. You might have to take on a capital investment or you might have to do that stuff. But if you know how to operate the business side and you can build a business plan and you can say, Hey, here's all our data to support what we're going to be doing. You can go get the money. There's so much money out in the world. There's so many people that are interested in, in this industry and this business all over the place. It may not might be in California. You might have to go move to a new opening state or something like that. But there's plenty of money. There's plenty of investment money out there. And people that are in this business already can, can go capitalize on that. Again, it's all about playing the game. But if you want to play it right, you need to be able to know how to approach the people who are going to put money in front of you. A thousand percent. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you expressing the amount of energy you had to put out and knowledge today is impressive, bro. I've been stoked to sit here and listen. I learned a ton. I finally took some books off the shelf and put them in front of us. Um, thank you for coming through, bro. Yeah. I only am closing this out because you literally have to catch a flight right now. Yeah. Like you have to head to the airport right <laughs> right now. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to... Uh I couldn't be out here too much. I've got yeah. another thing going on tomorrow. We have sales team me coming in and I got to Bro, teach them. A so. lot of people tugging and pulling at your time. I can only yeah. imagine with your knowledge, because I'm already thinking about my garden and like, oh man, I, I need to do tissue tests. I need to sap tests. I need to do all this stuff. Like, thank you, bro. Yeah, no Russ, problem. I enjoy, I enjoy it. And the, the, you can find me on all different types of platforms. Um, and there's all kinds of good information. Some of it will be like we do, where we go here and here and here. Some of it is more directed towards <sighs> certain topics. Um, so there's tons of information. And again, you can pretty much find me on any, everywhere if you look. Yeah. And no matter whether you're a hydroponic grower, a cannabis grower, a soil grower, cocoa, or whether you're into other cultivation types, whether it's cactuses, whether it's chili peppers, chili peppers, fruit, chili peppers right now. Exactly. So it's a broad spectrum. Uh, Russ Brandon, first smoke of the day. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having me. See you guys soon. Hey, stop. Before you leave, roll up another one. We got more episodes just like this. Click right here.